Agora sim. Bom dia a todos. Good morning, everyone. So we'll start the third day of our seventh colloquium in the public sector account and data analytics uh, partnership between the Vargas Foundation and Huttigers University. Uh, for the, today, we have the final presentations for this colloquium, and we will start this morning with the paper Determinants of Governmental Auditing, uh, uh, Auditing Qualified Opinion. And I'll hand the mic to Professor Eduardo. So please, the mic is yours. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, I just made a few jokes, but was recording. It was very, very fun. Everyone laughed. Anyways, <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the term of, of governmental auditing, qualified opinion. So I'm going to start a few questions. And uh, as the presentation goes on, we're going to understand exactly what the questions mean, and uh, we're going to try to answer each of them. So the first thing is that are politically indicated counselors more lenient than the technical body? The second question is, do political affiliation affect counselors' decisions? And the third question is, can this result in our lives in space-time? So different states and period. But before answering the questions, we have to understand what they mean. And the first thing we have talked about is what is the court, the court of accounts, the Tribunal de Contas. Essentially, they, uh, they oversee public spendings by the executive sector. Uh, their goal is to uh, defend curb uh, malpractice by, by, the executive, by, by, by the executive body, by the mayors, and it's composed by essentially two uh, groups of people. One are the analysts, the second one are the counselors. The counselors are, are appointed by a politically appointed by a state governor and the state assembly, and two of them are tenured uh, servants. And the analysts are tenured public servants. What was important? Because the counselors are the ones who actually make the decision whether some account will, will be approved or not. But the analysts are the ones who read the accounts and see uh, what, uh, what irregularities are found. So the process is very, is, we have, I'm so, sorry, we have 33 uh, court accounts, uh, one in each state and a few other four specific municipalities and one in the, you should figure it out. TCU is the one that oversees everything from the federal spendings and uh, other things. We're, we're going to focus on, on the TC of PLE today. And then I'm going to talk about a little bit what we found uh, in the other states. So there's, uh, there are a few criticisms about how the, the counselors are appointed. The first one is that it's based on uh, political criteria, which means that because the mayors are also politicians from the same, from the same party, the auditee is essentially choosing the auditor. It's not exactly like that. Not like the mayor would say, well, I want you as the, as the counselor, but it's the same party, is the same political group. Second thing is that the requirements are very loose. So um, essentially, you can appoint almost everyone, almost anyone that has uh, some political and um, some political, political engagement or some experience in 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 accounts. political background and the tight relationships in, within that network. They are good candidates for being appointed. Is it needed that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. But um, the, the next one is the one I I. I I was trying to find, I, I, I'm reading everything. I, I wrote the presentation a while ago, at least this part. So um, the kind is they don't necessarily have the technical knowledge required to understand what's going on. They can be convicted of crimes or involved with corruption. And these are not removed from, from the pool of candidates. They can actually 
be elected, and that happened in Rio, for instance. On top of that, um, when we are complacent with the transgressions, we jeopardize the, the whole institution. So the point of the court of accounts is to oversee public spendings, but if they are being lenient, that it, it just doesn't work. Why do you bother overseeing accounts? And then just like in every single uh, political body, nepotism, clientelism are frequently denounced. So those are just few criticisms on how the Court of Counselors is, is built. But it's supposed to be a political, a political being. And the, and the reason is that politicians in Brazil judge politicians, and you need a soft and hard understanding on how, how people spend money. For instance, for a technician, uh, one month, two months delay in sending the other documents can be something hard, but the politician can understand, well, it's not like that. Life is much harder than, than it seems, so it's not really something we should worry too much about. It's an issue, yes, but it may not be too hard. Or something like, okay, um, it's missing 30 reais. But for, the, for the technical body, well, it's missing 30 reais. What else is missing? But for the political body, it's 30 reais, most likely just someone forgot to bring the bill and that's it. And that's why politicians have to be involved in that. Also, because if, you, if it's only technical, we, it's not very democratic in a sense that we have a technocracy as opposed to a democracy in which people appoint who is judging. Um, we'll just skip the rest of this slide. It's not really the most important thing, but let's talk about the due process. First, the mayor send all the documents for analysis. Then the analysts produce a report just listing what are the inconsistencies they found in the, in the analysis, what laws were violated, for instance, okay, you have to spend 25% something in something you did not spend. And then they send back to mayors who can actually contest some of these findings or actually just clarify some of the issues. Um, and then the analyst reads the, the, the qualification, says, well, uh, I agree with that. That's solved. Well, that's partially solved. Well, that, come on, it doesn't make any sense what you said. But it's just sometimes the mayors don't send anything. They say, I just agree with what happened. But the point is that up to now, one, two, three, we have only technical body and mayors uh, working. Now, uh, the next two steps are when you send the report to one counselor that one counselor that will read and decide which of the irregularities are relevant or not, and we make and we like make a suggestion whether the accounts should be rejected or not, or partially rejected, I mean partially accepted. That report, that counselor, the reporter. Yeah, that's the reporter. And then after the oh, that's done for the municipalities, not all municipalities, so actually each one is judged individually. The, the collegiate decides whether the accounts will be rejected, accepted, or partially accepted. So we have essentially three steps here that will depend on political education. The first one is from the HELCON, which is the report uh, written by the analysts with the regularities found after the, the after the qualification. What hell, which is written by the counselor, which essentially analyzes the hell column and then decides, okay, it makes sense, doesn't make sense, makes sense, doesn't make sense. And then Parprev um, is essentially the, the result of, of the collegiate decision. After the Parprev is written, so after the collegiate makes a decision, who, does, who actually uh, um, evaluate everything will be 
the legislative, legislative chamber. We're not going to talk about uh, deadlines, but it can take four years, for instance. So <laughs> a lot of things change in this time. And well, as we know, people just forget about things. But in here, what I'm going to focus is that what happens between Helcon and Votrel and what happens between Votrel and Parprev and what we can say about it regarding uh, leniency and regarding uh, political influence. That is collected from PLE 2017. The reason is 2017, the first year of mandate and people change affiliate, political affiliations less likely in the first year. Uh, and the Report, the, the reports that were analyzed were Helcom, Hotel, and Parfred. This data was initially analyzed by hand by grad students, uh, Alec. And I know Alec is here, and we all know that's what grad students are for, analyzing data. And she did a great work. And I'm going to present what she found. And then the challenges we had trying to replicate and extend the result to other uh, years and other states. And um, just trying to automate everything, not easy. Um, I'm not sure if it's completely possible, but how the data is collected. We access a website, we search for individual processes. We select which documents are relevant, clean up and aggregate all the data, and that's it. That's how we built the, the that, that's how we downloaded and that's how I let downloaded and created the, the data set of regularities. But more than that, we need, we had a data set with, we had a, a bunch of documents and we need to be more specific about the variables we care about. So we count the number of regularities in each document, Helcom, Vodhel, and Parprev. And then, uh, some consistencies, they actually have some separate level that automatically render the accounts um, rejected. Then the recommendation by the reporter and the, the court is, is also uh, not extracted. Part of the information about the mayor, the, the chamber, the the reporter, the counselors, and also some socioeconomic control variables that will be used for the identification of the, of the method. Ideally, what we can do is we can use natural language processing, the first step. We can use natural language processing and download data from the electoral tri tribunal. And then we can use some government data that's usually uh, that's actually available online to download the socioeconomic controls. So uh, when I read that, okay, that should be an easy task, it's not, but at least we know how we can move on. So let's answer the first question. Now we understand what it means mostly, mostly but let's try to answer the first question. A political, politically indicated counselors more lenient than the technical body. And then we have, uh, we have to be more specific about the meaning of leniency. First, how do we measure leniency? Well, um, we can use the number of unsolved and partially unsolved irregularities and the severity of final decision by the collegiate. By the collegiate. And we can say the, the counselor is lenient if the severity is reduced on the process or the number of regularities is reduced along the process. It means that um, the technical body consider a few things as being uh, regularities, but the counselor says, well, it's not. So that's what uh, being lenient means. And there are a few hypotheses. Uh, those hypotheses were written by uh, sorry, Alec and Ricardo. And the first one is that Auditors identify more inconsistencies. Reporter, uh, reporters identify more consistency in vote hell than the collegiate. So authors more than reporters, reporters more than the collegiate. The decisions made 
in Parprev follows those one in vote hell, which means that, okay, I'm just following what's going on, what was suggested by the, the reporter. And the last one is that the decision doesn't follow, but is not as harsh as, as suggested. Yes, 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 and hell yeah. What do you mean with hell yeah? It means that, first confirm in all cases, if it's not following, essentially all the recommendation is less, uh, it's, it's less strict. So instead of rejecting accounts, say, well, you don't have to reject that. Or instead of partially rejecting or partially accepting, depending on if the glass is half, full, half, half empty, say, well, just, just move on, let's accept this. So, uh, that's a particularly strong uh, signal that the collegiate's more lenient than, than the technicians. So we answered yes to the first question. We are very happy. And now we move on to the second question. Do political affiliations affect the council's decision? And again, we have to be a bit more specific here. Um, first, we have to understand the source of influence, of political influence that can appear in a Ricardo, controla meu tempo. The source of influences, of political influences that can appear. The first one is political alignment between the mayor and the councillors. The second one is political alignment between mayor and the state chamber. Why is that? Because the state chamber indicates some of the councillors. So that can be one source of influence. And then the questions that we are going to answer are, does the political alignment between the mayor political parties, the party of the councillor, the councillor or collegiate, each new suggestion have any effect on audit option, uh, on audit opinion? So in effect, um, I do mean if being the same party or different party will change or have a like, significant effect on the likelihood of, of rejecting or not accounts and the, or reducing the number of, of regularities. The second one is political support of the mayor state chamber. Does the political support in the legislative chamber by the mayor influence the number of inconsistencies listed in POE state of court of accounts? And the second one, does political support in the legislative chamber influence whether the municipalities are audited? And in that, um, there's something I didn't mention you. Some municipalities are just never audited in this time frame. Essentially, people forget or just delay auditing. And as I said, you people forget and people forgive, especially in Brazil. So the political alignment about mayors and councillors is split in two hypotheses. The first one is related to the decision, and the second one. Uh, sorry. The, yeah, so what, yeah, so related to the decision of, of rejecting or not the accounts. And the second one is regarding the decision about decision from the court. Yeah. Well, in hypothesis 3A, we, we wonder whether the uh, political alignment between the mayor and the reporter that signs the vote hell uh, affects the, how the uh, reporter will reject or not the accounts rendered by the, the, by the mayor. Why are we, a hypothesis 3B, we investigate whether the political alignment between the mayor that's rendering its accounts with the majority of the collegiate at the Tribunal de Contas will affect how the collegiate approves or not the accounts rendered by the mayor. So that's the, the two layers of political alignment between the that, mayor and the reporter in 3A and the mayor and the majority of the collegiate in 3B. Thank you, Dad. No, thank you. Um, and, uh, Essentially, uh, no, uh, there's, no uh, there's no evidence. Of course, um, we could add some controls there, but there's no uh, very clear effect 
whether the political alignment, political orientation has this uh, any any strong effect. Well, there's a bummer. We would expect something to show up there. It did not show up. Um, how do we interpret that? Well, we interpret that. Well, given two municipalities that have the same number of inconsistencies, which is uh, prior for how uh, severe is the is the is the is how long? So, how severe is the report after uh, the qualification? Uh, so, fixing that, do you have any influence on party? And well, no, not not really. No, it's not there. Then, um, political. Then you have to see what the political misalignment between mayor and chamber. Uh, have to see the those two hypotheses. So first. Uh, the support in the legislative, legislative chamber influence reduction in number of inconsistencies. What means reduction in number of consistencies? It means that although Bot Hell, which is the one by the reporter, um, is uh, sorry, although Hell Con, the one by the author, lists, I don't know, 10 irregularities, Bot Hell may list on five, only three, or can list 12. So usually, there's a reduction, as we found there. It, it's always, it, there's, there's a reduction. Uh, there's often a reduction in the number of, of irregularities. The second one is that, so first look at the, out, on the reporter now, moving from the reporter to the court. Um, is there a reduction of number of irregularities? It means that when the collegiate was evaluating the case, they instead of focusing on 10 irregularities or five, they focus on two. Well, does it happen? To recall, uh, Eduardo, that in the first two hypotheses, we identified that hypothesis one and hypothesis two, we identified that yes, oh yes, uh, the reporter presents less inconsistencies than the auditor, and yes, the collegiate presents less inconsistencies than the reporter. So based on this first evidence, we, in hypothesis four, we intend to investigate whether this behavior is, is affected by the political alignment. And, and then we have to think about a few issues before answer this question. It happens that, uh, how do you define political support in the chamber? I mean, Two people is enough, three, four. So we actually have to decide, a, we, we count the proportion of individuals in the same, um, in similarly aligned parties when elected. So, and it's, when elected, it's important because people can actually change, things change. Um, second thing is that the number of regularities, the, the variation is huge. So it can, it's from zero to, uh, remember the number, but I think it's over 30 or 40, it's, it's a very large number. Third thing is that some regulators, as I mentioned, they, rent, they should automatically reject accounts. So they cannot be ignored. And third is that socioeconomic backgrounds of municipalities cannot be ignored. As I said, some small municipalities, they have less resources to evaluate everything, to do everything by the book. Um, bigger municipalities have a more complex machine. So, we really have to take that into account. You know the answer? No. Okay. The answer is no. Uh, again, bummer. But um, we do find there is a uh, it's like reduction. So the direction of the coefficient is correct, but it's just too small. Okay. So we don't really see any influence in, in these two cases. Uh, there are criticisms. I'm going to cite a few. But now, remember that I said the fail counts, few municipalities are never audited. Well, in 2017, from 2017 to until 2022, so uh, roughly four years have passed. 13% of the municipalities have not been audited. So the question is why? That's where I'm going to find the political influence. 
So the fifth hypothesis is that accountants municipalities are, uh, the accounts of municipalities are not audited when mayor has major support in the judiciary chamber. What do you guys think? No, no, that's a bum again. No, no, no. So, uh, well. <laughs> no. So maybe what the problem is that political influence as we are measuring based on alignment between the political parties cannot explain, but other factors might explain and we will want to continue working this project. It's still a working paper. Yeah, that's one step. Other things that we, we may want to control or other things, we may want to consider only that pillars that are really uh, relevant. For instance, uh, you delayed four days the, the, in the, send me the papers, like, okay, it's four days, come on, it's four days. It takes a few months to actually submit to the author. So it's all right. So maybe you have to take that into account. But the fact is, there's no evidence that political affiliation, as we measured, affect council's decision. And um, it's restricted to PLE 2017, because the data is only from there. You know, we have to see whether we can generalize the result to other states and periods. And, um, now I have to speak faster because I only have five minutes and I can actually speak very fast. So if I'm speaking too fast, just let me know. So can we generalize to other places? Well, that's not very easy and we haven't really run the experiments, especially because we would have to think about how to measure political influence. As we know, we don't really have any significant results there. So how do we do? We can scrap download, scrap data using NLP to extract, evaluate, the severity and get the decisions, equal information about councils, download parts information, scrap download and social economic information about municipalities and everything, but let's do it with stickers. So what has to be done by people? What has to be done by computers? The first four things have to be done by people. And the reason is, well, uh, each, um, actually I explained the reason afterwards, but the, the reason is the first things, they have to be very specific to each state. Things are not very uh, uh, standardized. But the final two, we can actually do uh, the computer. It's very easy because all the data is already there. We don't really have to build a data set. Reports on other, uh, other courts, they are essentially uh, difficult to obtain. Information is, is there, it's there. It's just like a dictionary, but not an actual dictionary where you order things by, I don't know, the letter, like every dictionary. It's ordered by how funny the words sound. So trousers might sound funnier than I don't know, car, just like a kid ordered that. And that's how things are ordered inside there. For instance, in Sao Paulo, we have access to all documents, all documents. It's a lot of things. It's very difficult really to shove that pie off. Well, um, hey, and get what, what we need. Um, naming is not standard. So I'm calling hell cone, but hell and everything, but that's not how people call everywhere. That's how people call in PLB. And um, we cannot really use computers to download the data in most places. Um, we have captures and other things that we have to get around. And sometimes they can just block automated access. But we have done that in PLV. We have downloaded data in, from, from other years in, in PLV. And Julie and Philippe implemented a framework that we expect is actually applicable to other places. First, we get the data, then we pre-process data, um, to actually a uh, machine readable format. And then we extract the data using uh, regular patterns. And although the patterns can be different with, between states, they're very consistent between reports. And that's a very, very, very good thing to know. We can extract regularities relatively easy. So uh, implement regex, build a structured data set, and then we see how well it works. And here is some code. So uh, we did our homework. Let's show some code. And you see that the code is relatively simple. Um, we really have to download data and uh, apply a number of, of regular expressions to build the data set. The data set is relatively simple, but quite rich. We got report, text, the name of the, of the regularity, which is, can be used to classify its severity. Um, what the mayor said, what the, what the, the analyst said, okay, it's, 
it didn't fix it. And uh, the conclusion, all right? Comparing with the machine and human data set, it's very similar, but of course there are some things that don't really match. So look at the first three lines, things are already is slightly, is slightly different, but that's all right. As statisticians, we love noise, but not too much. And that's not too much. As we see, we can actually get right and we can extract most regularities automatically. Uh, almost all regularities actually. And all the recommendations. But um, Portuguese is a very difficult language. Sometimes the recommendations are not straightforward and they're not directly written. I say, okay, approve and approve. It's not like that. Things can be much more subjective than that. Uh, what about the part and socioeconomic information? Cost information has to have to be collected manually. Uh, it changes, it, it's not clear where it is for every single state. Um, and everything else is already online. It can, can be automated. So um, we have already reports, regularities, parts information, and some source of information 2017. We don't really expect it has changed between 2017 and 2020. We need reports from other um, courts, which is quite hard to get. And we need electoral and social information from other states and years as well, if we want to extend that to other uh, states and years. So um, as you see, I don't have, really have a table with a econometric model for a good reason. I don't have the econometric model. And we have to discuss how we can actually measure the political influence and whether that was the best way to do or whether the controls were um, all right. So uh, maybe you have to take into account the type of regularity. As I said, few regularities are just okay. Maybe uh, results to POE are not general, generalizable to other states. So it means that, okay, uh, we are measuring this correctly. POE is just different. Other controls, for instance, government transfers, uh, some states and some municipalities, they receive transfers and depending on the size of the state can be larger, smaller. So there are many conditions that can actually uh, change a little bit how uh, things are evaluated. And looking at partnership in Brazil may not be the best way to assess support. Uh, now we, do, we do have a split in opinion, but we do have like a big center that's very fluid and just go with the mass. Regarding automation, it's difficult. I, I, I'd say uh, not impossible, but you do need some humans to implement things to scrap data from OTCs. Um, reports, they very wildly length and language, and it, it's just very different from place to place. For instance, Sao Paulo, you just have a table, very objective. POE, you have a very long report explaining each uh, regularity. So Sao Paulo may be easier to get the regularities, but it's difficult to find the documents. And we implemented everything in POE, but as I said, the language is quite uh, 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 standard. So we believe things will generalize directly to other states. Okay, I'm done. Do you have any questions? Please, have questions. For questions. Yeah. Uh, con congratulations. Uh, I saw you, you mentioned that the, this fluidity, fluidity of part partnerships here in Brazil. Uh, did, you, did you manage to try to, to, to test uh, the, this uh, actual polarization? Uh, I mean, group the, 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 part, the, the parties uh, against these two poles that it exists since, I don't know, 2015? No. I can I can extend on that, but that was the most objective answer. And uh, it's it would be like quite far away from the the cause of the work, uh, but you do have to check the literature because I know things have changed a lot since two thousand and and thirteen, is and and fourteen, and the election was a bit uh, complicated there. So, but I don't know. But as far as I know, there is that has had some polarization. But we are talking about state chambers and things can change in very lot state by state. In Rio um, is one thing, in Piauí can be another thing, in Manaus can be another thing, in Amazonas can be another thing. Mm -hmm. So that, that's something we have to check what is going on in each state and see whether this type, this way of measuring uh, bipartisanship is realistic. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. one, one last question. One might, one might believe that, that this influence, uh, this political influence might be uh, stronger, not with the audit per se, but with the consequences of the, the, that, that audit. I mean, if the audit indicates something to, to, to be done or some punishment or something in that regard, uh, if you have the right alliance of the right connections, you probably uh, put this on, on the on, on the fruit on the. Agree. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly what I did. What did, I did you get this this part? No. So no, no. That no. The that's the next step. Okay. I mean, okay. the consequence is very is very relative, right? Because who decides whether it's a consequence or not is the legislative chamber, yeah. which means that they can just say, well, you know, yeah, it's long mean, past. We don't care about it anymore. But um, the the. The thing is that the irregularities, they have severity levels and that can be mapped. And if we only consider the more severe irregularities, then maybe we have some, some, some effect there. Yeah. So that, that's one thing. But uh, it's been observed, I forgot the name of the author, that it has happened. So essentially, uh, people that are highly politically connected, I forgot the name of the author, they usually it takes more time and they're more lenient with the, the, the audit process. Thank well, you, excellent. congratulations. Okay, thank you. Additions to Arlete, actually. Do you have more questions? Questions from the virtual audience? No. So thank you, Eduardo, for the presentation. Thank you, Arlete, Julie. Philip for this work in progress, just in time, amazing. Uh, Ricardo, você está na área? Hello, Enrico Bratti. How are you doing? Good morning. Nice to see you. Good afternoon for you there. I don't know how time is it there. Hi, Ricardo. Hi, everyone. Thank you Hi, for nice you. inviting me. A pleasure. Uh, so now let's move to the second paper that is presented by Ricardo, uh, Felipe, and myself. And we also have a quartership with Professor Jose Elias that is in the flight right now. So he has no access to any connection. And uh, we count with the support from Leonardo Nascimento from the World Bank uh, to discuss this, this project. So I will start sharing the screen. Okay, this is the one. So, Ricardo, may I start? Please, Ricardo, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, the, the main focus of this study is to investigate whether the understandability of accounting standards by professional accountants is affected by the readability of the accountant standards per se. So there is the standard that accountants might follow in order to prepare the financial statements of a specific organization. So those standards are more or less reliable. Uh, and then we want to see whether such a reliability, the characteristic of the accounting standard affects how professionals uh, uh, perceive the understandability that, that how they are, how well they understand that specific piece of document. So let's move forward. Uh, we are talking about the public sector here. So the accounting standards we are talking about is uh, that the Brazilian version of the IPSAS, International Public Sector Account Standards, that is uh, translated by the Federal uh, Association of Accountants and then incorporated by this treasury into this handbook that shall be applied by all public sector accountants here in Brazil. Uh, so the purpose is, as I said, to investigate how the Brazilian government accounting handbook's readability form and shape. So we go beyond the readability. We also investigate some characteristics and metrics from the, the document impacts accountants understandability of that document. Why? 
because subordinated to the Minister of Economy, the Treasury regulates the government accounting for the entire Brazilian Federation. So as we said, as Eduardo showed in the previous paper, we have 33 audit institutions that supervise the accounts rendered by 5,569 municipalities, the federal district plus 26 states plus the federal government itself. And so how many users of this document are outside there, considering all public sector accountants and auditors? So uh, the influence of the treasury in regulating the government accounting for the entire Brazilian Federation is really huge and relevant. And then why does the STN, the treasury do that? Among other reasons, because the treasury is responsible for consolidating the whole of government accounts here in Brazil. So the treasury collects the financial statements from all those entities, municipalities, states, and so on, and then bind them together in the consolidated whole of government accounts. That's why having a, a consistent uh, and comparable financial statement following the same accounting policies is crucial. And the account the, this handbook establishes such comparability. Uh, and uh, we are very happy that we have Leonardo Nascimento with us here because he, today, he works for the World Bank. And as you know, the World Bank is much concerned about the performance and the financial position and fiscal position of Brazilian institutions or many, many jurisdictions public sector organizations. And before that, in his previous life, he was uh, working for the treasury and tightly related to these, his activities with this handbook. So uh, Leonardo, can you please talk about pretty quickly <laughs> about uh, the concerns that the World Bank and the treasury has about the readability of this document and how professionals really understand this document? Okay, thank you, Ricardo. Good morning to everyone. Uh, first, uh, uh, the, the World Bank is uh, concerned about public sector accounting is related to risks. Uh, every project of the, the World Bank, we, we need to evaluate risks, assess risks, and uh, it impacts on the the, the the financial uh, management uh, arrangements and internal control arrangements. <clears throat> and the World Bank is interested in this effort of uh, standardizing public sector accounting because it may represent um, uh, comparable, complete, and accurate and transparent uh, uh, public sector accounts and in the context of risks, it's very important to, to have transparency and it, it impacts on governance to, of, of the projects and the, the, the institutions that the World Bank supports. And the partnership with the, the, uh, of the World Bank with the National Treasury uh, has three main objectives that we, we need to uh, set here. Uh, first, the support of, of the development of tools and reports uh, related to standard setting activities, um, assessment and monitoring related to the implementation of accrual based IPSIS. Uh, the second uh, support is uh, joint efforts of the STN and size and uh, supreme audit institutions uh, and preparers, financial reports, and internal control entities in order to enforce the, the, the compliance with uh, IPSAS and Brazilian public sector accounting standards. And the third objective is uh, support capacity building of the initiatives uh, in the national and subnational level, levels uh, regarding standards implementation, such as seminars, webinars, and so on. Yesterday, uh, the uh, the eighth, uh, I think the eighth uh, seminar, Brazilian public sector seminar of the National Treasury took place and virtually, and we support them in, in, in some of the, 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 the logistics of the event because it's very important to us to participate and attend to this event. 
And, and that's it. And on the, the first phase of this proposed partnership, we've made a diagnosis with the Kurds of accounts to know what we can uh, move forward on the partnership of the SDN, the National Treasury, with the Kurds of accounts. In, and, and diagnosis, it's, a, it's the, the baseline to, to improve this relationship between the, the various, the, the, the multiple regulators of public sector accounting in Brazil. But uh, this work is very relevant uh, about the, the readability of the, the, the public sector accounting because it's related to transparency. Transparency is not only uh, provide information, but understand the information, understand what is prepared by the public sector accountants. And, we are, we are, I am looking forward to know the, the, the presentation to, to, uh, and the results of the, this research. Thank, Thank you, Leo. You. Thank you, indeed. So before going, going back to the purpose of the paper and the results, I think it's pretty necessary to explain a little bit some foundations. What we are talking about readability is how easy the content is easy to understand. So readability simply means how easy it is to read a piece of content. I won't read everything, but readers struggle to find what they need in difficult reading context. And most of that, keeping readers interested and engaged is crucial to any writer. But if the piece of content written is not easy to understand, we might, not, we might lose readers and they, they, they will not get engaged on what we are doing here. Uh, on the other hand, the understandability is the quality of comprehensible language or thought. So anything comprehensible is clear and intelligible. You can understand it, capable of being comprehended or understood. So this is the main idea that we have here. So it is applied to any content like any textbook in physics, in mathematics, in accounting, as well as in medicine documents like the drug factors of any, any, any drug that you take, as well as it's applicable to financial statements because we have under the conceptual framework from IPSISB, the conceptual framework from the IFRS Foundation, they need to provide understandable. Uh, financial statements, a compreensibilidade do relatório financeiro in Portuguese. So it's really necessary, it's vital to keep financial statement users engaged in understanding and using financial statements. And we go also beyond that, because if preparers of those financial statements don't understand the accounting standards, they will not provide useful financial information. So that's why as Leonardo was saying, uh, the readability and the understandability of the account standards is so important here. Uh, it's applied only, not only to account standards for the private sector, as well as to the public sector, as we are discussing in this paper. So the point is, if readers don't understand it, they will not be able to interpret and properly ap apply the standards. They might ask for help, the problem is that if the, those that will help don't understand it either, so it's a problem not with the, the, the reader, it's a problem with the writer. The piece of information is not understandable. Uh, another uh, concept that might make some confusion is the legibility. We are not talking about the legibility in this paper. The, it's related to the recognizing letters and visual comfort from the reading of word of text. So, there are different way, different typo, types of letters that you can use. We are not investigating these, whether time is new Roman is better than, than Verdana. We don't care about that in this paper. Uh, so not the shape of the elements, just to keep it clear. So Ricardo, are you around? Can you go for this, this set of slides now, please? Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, I, I, uh, the, 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 our research uh, there are, was composed by two, two main steps. Né? The, the first one, uh, or uh, 
great uh, uh, job here uh, was to capture the understandability of the users MCASP. Uh, MCASP is a main handbook of accounting in Brazil. All the public sector organization use the, the uh, handbook. Né? And uh, uh, our main concern was how to capture the uh, understandability about, uh, from the, the users, MCASP users. And uh, uh, we uh, use two uh, steps. The first one was uh, using from uh, ca capturing from the users how they perceive né, their uh, their understandability about the uh, about their own experience reading the the handbook. The the this was captured uh, with a. Uh, uh, a survey, an electronic questionnaire, and the, the second was uh, an electronic uh, calculus uh, made by a, a proxy using the text, né? uh, using the machine learning and nature, uh, nature uh, language process, NLP. Yeah, yeah, NLP. Thank you, Thank you Ricardo. Uh, so this is what we have for the what we might use as an in the, the key independent variable for our analysis is the readability of the document and i will ask philippe to just plus jump in and help me present it hello good morning to all um, just let here so when you, we are talking about understandability we are talking about the, the quality of information that is perceived by the user and how that happens. The, the manual, the, the reading part, the text itself contains information and this information needs to reach the users and who later on will apply them. And when we, when we say that the, the text has some information, is the self itse itself contains information. And there's the entropy of the information that is the, the information that moves from the text to the reader. And that's the part of the decoding the text. And after the reader reads the text, he can apply what he, re he has uh, perceived. And there's some, there some noise in this process. So, we are talking about the textual aspects of the manual itself, the written part itself, but also we are talking about the reader's uh, aspects. So there is, there is the influence of the text and there is the influence of the reader. And when we say understandability, we, we are talking about how the information moves from one, from the beginning to the, the, the end point. And this is very, hard to measure actually, because how can we say that the, the reader understands what he just got, he read? And there's some forms of doing that, but that's not feasible because we should apply tests, for instance, for many, many readers, and this is not feasible. So we have a proxy for the understandability, that is the readability. So we remove the aspects from the reader, and we focus on the textual aspects. So this is a prox. So what we are saying is that the text, some part of the information that compose the understandability comes from the text itself. And this is a, the prox. And textual aspects are related to the number of characters, the number of words, the number of sentence, the complex words that the complex words are the, the size of the word itself. In Portuguese, we have many words that have many syllables. And we can compose different uh, metrics like the words per sentence, complex words per, per certain number of words, and so on. And using these metrics, we can you form, can get we can reach different readability formulas like the flash rating easy, the gunning fork index, the smoke, the Coleman, the Riggs, and so on. 
And each one of these formulas uh, had, has focused on some audience, has focused on some aspect, but they are all, all, con all concentrated on relating textual aspects to the readability and understandability for, for um, I don't know. I, I don't know how to. Consequently, thank you, Ricardo. So we we are not investigating all the readability formula. We are where we are we chose to to focus on the flash easing score and the gunning fork indexed, and the readability on the flash reading easy is measured on a scale that comes from zero zero to one hundred, and you, you consider this the total syllables per words and the total words per sentence. And why we are saying that when you use long sentence and when you use long words, you should be facing some trouble reading the text. And since there is a difference in the word metrics in the Portuguese and the English vocabulary, there is just some adjust for the, this, this index, this, this formula. And the gunning fox index uses also these metrics of words per sentence and complex words per words. Uh, but they, they, the, the, the weights of, of the, these verbals are, are some, dif somehow different. And you could also investigate other things such as human interest and the grade level that should be uh, the person who is reading the text should, should have to to truly understand this, this scale. So, like I said, readability is a proxy for the understandability, but it doesn't capture the, the aspects of the reader. And it doesn't capture the aspects of the text itself. Uh, so we are incorporating something else to try to explain the understandability. And this, what we incorporate is what we call the, the shame and the form of the document, the structure of the document. So beyond using the readability, we are, all, we are also using aspects like the size of the chapter. So long chapters and small chapters should influence the audience we are using the number of subsections. Sometimes we get a, a book and we are reading and you are in the item 1.2.3.4 and so on. And so where, where I started from, and there are some texts that use the examples. And in this case in particular, it's very useful uh, to use examples to illustrate what you just thought. And Tables, footnotes also could help understand better the text as the itemization. That's when you use bullet points. So here you are seeing some examples of what we are calling the forming structures of the document of things that are appearing in these different chapters of the document. Yeah, just to make sure this is what we are calling itemization using bullet points and uh, number of subsections like this, uh, structuring the document in clear boxes. Uh, so following up what is being presented. Thank you. So just to make it clear, what the paper is about? What is in the scope of this paper? We are trying to identify those characteristics of the document affecting how users understand or perceive the understanding of that specific piece of document. In this case, the accounting standards for the public sector. However, we also would be keen to investigate further, but these other aspects is out of the scope of this specific paper. So we are not analyzing how the, how the quality of financial statements is influenced by the understanding of the account standards. We are not investigating it, as well as we are not investigating how users of financial statements understand the financial statements per se. We are in the first layer over there 
other issues are outside the scope of this paper and could be uh, suggested for our future research. So saying about uh, talking about a little bit of how how the is the workflow, the data flow. We have the manual, then CASP, uh, who has the form, shape, and structures, has this, this textile aspects. And for, from there, we get some, we can structure a data frame. And also, we, Ricardo, you could talk about a little bit of the questionnaire that complements the, the data frame you are using to, to try to measure this readability and the understandability. Oh, yes. Uh, regarding specifically the questionnaire, where we measure the, uh, how users perceive the understandability of the document, as Leonardo is saying, we work together in that initiative between the World Bank and the National Treasury, investing in trying to help the Treasury in improving the readability of the account standards. So Ricardo, myself, and Jose Elias worked in that project with the World Bank. And in order to provide uh, the Treasury some suggestions on improving the, the quality of the, the readability of the, the account standard, we, as we prepared an electronic questionnaire under SurveyMonkey that we call a diagnostic. A diagnostic about how users perceive the quality of the account standard. And one of those questions was, how do you perceive how well you understand each, each chapter of that? So there is a chapter for uh, inventory, a chapter for revenue, a chapter for depreciation, proper print equipment, so on. So we ask it, under a scale from zero, I don't understand at all. To 10, I understand it pretty well. Uh, how do you perceive how well you understand the document? Eduardo, please. Who answered the, this questionnaire? Is the survey monkey? Okay. The, survey, the questionnaire was answered during this period between January, the end of January, beginning, the end of last 21st, beginning of this year. And it was answered by 420 uh practitioners and by practitioners we mean public sector accounting accountants that really get engaged in preparing the financial statements from states and municipalities and how did we reach them the treasury as leonardo has just said just made yesterday con conclude yesterday the 80th uh seminar on teaching them how to apply the accounts done so they have a, a very a large and comprehensive network of financial accountants from all over Brazil, from the south to north. And then the treasury sent them an email inviting them to answer this specific questionnaire, since it would be used not only for our research, but for trying to enhance and improve the, the, the standard itself. Uh, yes, anonymous. We didn't collect any name from anyone and completely uh, anonymous in that regard. Ricardo, and to here, and to just to make clear, so we are using a data frame that is, is uh, comprehended by the form structure from the MCASP, the manual, and we are adding it the, the response of the questionnaires. Yes. So our data frame captures uh, aspects from the text itself and capture aspects of the respondents. How they perceive it. So uh, I'll, I'll, I can talk about a little bit, a little bit how we, we form the metrics and the metrics and to, to the manual it's uh, the, the idea is to automatic extract this information that is available. We have different chapters, we have uh, different structures, and we are using the natural language process. That's basically like Philip Buschenberger said yesterday, Britland, uh, a way that machine can extract information from text. So we are extracting information from text, and this is this information 
uh, is, is we get this information by reading the manual, uh, selecting the, the chapters. We can split the, the manual in, in different chapters. For each, each chapter, we clean the text. And this is the, the main process that uh, mach machine is very useful because there is a lot of information that needs to be cleaned before processing it because you have the titles and you have the subtitles and you, uh, you have uh, some, some sort of, uh, when you are using the examples, there are some space that are, are not needed. There is something that just does, doesn't fit just the, the text and you need to clean the text so it can be used to get the metrics that is the syllabus and the, the count of words, the count of sentence, and that's how we get the readability uh, metrics chapter. So uh, considering what's the scope of this paper, so that we follow those three steps, uh, originating data, I mean by originating because calculating the readability, as Philippe just said, use a natural language process, and then applying the survey to collect primary data from how accountants perceive that understandability. Then we unified it because there were completely different data sets, and then we had to bind them together. And the link between these two bases was the chapter the chapter of the account standard, like one for inventory, one for pp &E, one for revenue and so on. So how a, a professional, prof, uh, practitioners in, uh, perceive the understandability of that specific piece of document and the characteristics that we measure based on uh, natural language processing. And then the, the analysis. And the analysis, I will not follow all these three models, but in all of them, how practitioners uh, understand or perceive the understanding of the, hand, the handbook is the dependent variable and the independent or explanatory variables or the readability either measured with the flash or fog index and then the frequency of use of the, the, the standard that we also collected based on SurveyMonkey, users knowledge, if they, the user's education level, the specialization, whether they are public servants or not, whether they are accountants or bookkeepers, uh, or, or they have other backgrounds as well, their uh, time of year in years, experience in years, gender, and so on. So these are characteristics from the accountants, in addition to the readability. And we also run a second model with the same dependent variable, but now the explanatory variables, in addition to readability, we use the other characteristics from the document, like Philippe was just saying, number of pages, itemization, sub-items, pictures, tables, examples, footnotes, and so on and so forth. And these are the primary preliminary results. About uh, how practitioners perceive how they understand the handbook, we have, uh, Ricardo, can you help me with this? Yes, uh, this, the, this one is our dependent variable. This, uh, this, uh, this is a, a self-declared variable about uh, uh, collected from the, the survey monkey, né? Uh, electronic questionnaire. And in each of chapters, 25 chapters, the respondent, the, the, there are uh, specialists in MCASP and MCASP users, response uh, how they perceive the, the comprehension or understanding about the, the chapter. Uh, this, uh, this table uh, are, uh, is present in, in an order, the main comprehension to less uh, comprehension, né? the first line, the more compreh comprehensive. Uh, information. Uh, the, uh, for example, budgetary expenditure and budgetary revenue. Uh, it's uh, interesting. Uh, uh, we put uh, two uh, main analyses uh, in, in this in this uh, slide. The first one, uh, I, I don't know. I, I think we we have uh, experts in in MCAS because 
é, de mim, né? É, our scale was é, zero to ten, né? É, the, the understand about very the... Low, zero, very high understandability, ten. Yeah. And uh, all the, the chapters, é, the, the mean or average uh, was high, né? In mean or median. Uh, but uh, I don't know, I, I think you, you, our respondent was experts, né? Or they, And, uh, or they lied. They said that they understand much more than they actually understand <laughs> the standard. And the variability is quite small. If we take by the median, the second column, from mm -hmm. seven to nine, under a scale that range from zero to 10. So yeah. really, uh, we, this is a limitation in, in, uh, in this study that is how self-declared perceiving uh, professionals self-declare how they perceive the understandability. But as Ricardo was just saying, in the top, we have pretty old accounting standards for budgetary reports. And in the bottom, we have more sophisticated, more uh, accrual-based accounting standards like impairment, investment property, public consortia, borrowing costs that might be there are the newer standards and then they understand it less well than they do for the old standards like budgetary information. Uh, Ricardo, do you have something else to complement in this, this slide? Uh, I think uh, this, is, uh, this result is important because this present, uh, the focus in, in our accountant uh, environment Uh, keeps uh, uh, in inf budgetary information. Uh, we are discussing uh, accrual information since uh, I don't know 15 years. Then, uh, but uh, uh, we we read in several papers uh, that the account the account the main information in account in Brazil is uh, about the budgetary information. But uh, we don't do not had. Uh, a proxy, a, a measure to, to present this. And, and this present, the, our users, MCASP, né, especialized users, uh, understand better the old information, budgetary information. For me, it's uh, uh, obvious, but interesting to present this. Leonardo? Yes. Well, we have the, the double system of yeah. accrual base and budgetary base. Is Anybody Cherry is much more understood, better understood than approved. Hey, kind. We have a question from Leonardo. Yes, Leonardo. Yeah. Just, a, just a, a quick question. Uh, is it possible that there is a, a bias uh, that is changing the results of their understandability indices? I say that because I say this because it, it may be influenced by the difficulty of implementation and not the difficulty of understanding. Uh, I don't know you, if you. Yeah, understand. or the difficulty of uh, implementing is due to the difficulty of understanding. And then since it's new, they might be resistant to change and then they are not so keen to properly understand and implement. I think this is all confusing here and we cannot disentangle what is what in this, the way we collect data. Uh, I don't know if it would be feasible to do that. Uh, probably under an experiment, we would try to, to do that. But it's out of the scope of this paper at all, now, unfortunately. Yes, Eduardo. Just an observation, maybe an idea. Um, you see that uh, one of the chapters is elements of the financial statements that ranks below uh, a few others. And as I understand, uh, I can be wrong, but elements of financial statements can be something, should be something that everyone understands quite well, right? So up uh, in the top, I think it's a one, two, three, four, five, six. Yes. So that, that ranks lower than most. So maybe if you analyze the data and try to condition on some factors, you may be able to, to have a more uh, trustworthy uh, data set. But now I'm afraid because I'm also presenting and, and managing time because we have a vehicle to, for the next panel. So there is a conflict of interest. 
on managing time and presenting. So I have 10 minutes to finish all of this. So I need to rush a little bit and speak faster as Eduardo just did before. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, this is also the dependent variable. Oh, we also got an, ad an additional uh, variable under the questionnaire that is what do users of the handbook uh, prefer? The, uh, if the treasury would uh, implement more examples or more tables or more flow charts or more decision trees in illustrating the requirements and accounting policies within the account standard uh, handbook, what they would prefer. And they prefer the first order, number one, they prefer first, that's why the, the score is lower, uh, are more examples about double entry bookkeeping, uh, the account entries, uh, then followed by explanatory notes for the notes, the financial statements, and then account examples about other procedures and so on. Uh, so it's interesting just because we have chapters where we identified how many of each of these uh, is present there. Uh, regarding the independent variable, the preliminary results that we have is how they understand, how they perceive their understanding about the document, as we said, self-declared. And what we have here, Ricardo, can you, can you help me please? Pretty quickly, yes. just to hear. Five minutes to finish. Yeah, I, I will talk quickly. Um, the, 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 first, the, the first reflection is uh, we are in the beginning in this analysis and uh, we are uh, uh, trying to understand now, uh, until now the, the results. But uh, uh, in this, uh, the, this first model, uh, the, this model focuses on personal characteristic of users, MCASP, né? we are uh, investigating uh, how the uh, my main car characteristic, uh, for example, for formal education, hiring in, in my uh, organization, etc., my uh, knowledge about ICT, uh, uh, my formation in account law, etc., uh, uh, affect the, the comprehension of the, the other chapter or dependent variable variable uh, we use a, a, a panel data uh, in each chapter né? the understanding of each chapter we present uh, uh, two slides uh, before well uh, we we see in in this first first model uh, readability is significant to understand but only uh, when control, controlled by years of user experience, the, the models two and three. Then uh, we see uh, the signal of uh, the variable flash, flash BR variable uh, flip present. Uh, uh, we can note the, the model one and four, uh, one and four, the result uh, are negative and mod models to entry the but not significant the, uh, ah yeah and the model two and three is significant okay and positive. thank you and positive um, and it's well, good because uh, flash range from zero to 100 and 100 is easier to better readable easier readable while zero is less readable so he, he, since it's positive and significant here, means that as higher the readability of the document, uh, easier it is to understand and then practitioners uh, perceive the understanding better. Isn't it, Ricardo? Yeah. Good. But it only fits when we add as a control variable the professional's experience in years. Can I move forward or do you want to explain something here? like no. their professionals characteristics also affecting how they understand the document but negatively so lawyers <laughs> negatively and significantly perceive the account standard here uh i'm not okay but accountants too so never mind about the lawyers now moving forward ricardo 
what we have instead of using uh, fog, no, uh, flash, now you use fog here. And the results are almost the same, isn't it, Ricardo? Yes, and um, models are still being developed. Um, I, I think we need to know if uh, what the model present, uh, if uh, what the model present makes sense. But uh, uh, the first explanation about the, the, the signals of, of flash and fog results, huh? the first explanation should be, do is the proxy, this proxy makes sense for, for Brazil. Huh? Uh, uh, Felipe presented to us, uh, uh, adjust in the variable to we apply in Brazil. But uh, this is a first question to us. Uh, to, uh, to us. Uh, but uh, there are uh, an uh, alternative explanation. Uh, it may result for, from the specialization of account teams who already have knowledge about the technical terms used. In this, if this uh, makes sense, the uh, sentence, uh, the length of sentences, the complexity of tests should not, uh, in this document, uh, uh, relevant to to him. I don't know. In any case, uh, it's it, it is possible to infer that uh, character characteristics from the documents are important, like sub items, pictures, example tables. These uh, are important uh, for this understand the the MCAS, uh, how the the results are, are presented to us. But uh, uh, how I, I, I said that uh, we are in the beginning in in analysis in this analysis. But the result is very interesting uh, for for us. And what's more tricky, as Ricardo just said, uh, we need to go back to the the reliability of these metrics and if they are really relevant to this research. It's because in this model, it's the reverse of what we would expect. Flash is higher more easier to read but it is negatively associated and significantly associated with understanding while fog is the reverse the higher more complex the more difficult to follow but it's positively associated with how accountants perceive its understanding so this is a puzzle for us as ricardo just said but adding and echoing what ricardo said and i think it might be very interesting to, to the treasury and to the road bank is the fact that uh, the characteristics of the document, like whether the chapter is organized and broken down between sub items, yes, it helped positively, helped it significantly helped understanding the chapters, uh, presenting tables, to explain and illustrate what's being presented there, also positively help them, as well as presenting charts. Also, they, they like they, they like a chart. We didn't ask if they like, but once the chapters present chapters, tables, and, and sub items, uh, they perceive it as more understandable. A, 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 a tricky uh, result that we also have here is concerning the examples. Uh, those chapters that has uh, numerical examples, uh, they perceive it as less understandable. Might be the examples are not good, or the, the chapters where as the, the treasury decide to include an example, it's because they are really much more difficult to follow. So the examples are okay, I don't know, but in anyhow, uh, since they are so difficult to follow, too deep for me, so as uh, the treasury decide to include their examples, but it's still, it's not, uh, I don't know if it's not helping that much. So we need to, to continue analyzing the results and discussing, especially with Leonardo and colleagues from the treasury to see how we can extract and better help them uh, improving the, the, the document. Hello, please. Very interesting, Ricardo. Um, so I think one thing important to consider is the uh, inherent difficulty of the content itself. So you mentioned uh, you show some uh, interesting uh, statistics in the beginning that the older standards 
that have been around for a while uh, had higher uh, understandability, right? Because they, they, they're more experienced in using them, implementing them, and they already know that content. But the newer content is harder to, um, perhaps harder to uh, understand. So one thing maybe you can control in the analysis is that the recency of the of the standard, how old it's it's been, how old it is, right? How long it's been around, um, uh, and maybe the uh, the that could explain the um, uh, the contradictory results of the fog index there. Maybe the older content, right? The older standards are the ones that have more content and more complexity in the text because it's more developed. It's been around for for uh, a longer time, so that it comes up with a higher complexity index. I echo what you just said, because yesterday we were pre preparing this table, you just see yesterday uh -huh. we were discussing, and we thought, well, we need to take the fog and the flash for each chapter and go through the document with manually and read and see how, how foggy it is to understand uh -huh. how easy, or, and then we might try to improve the analysis. Yeah, I do agree and with you. also once you showed in the other table um, about the uh, experience level is important. I was thinking maybe something interesting to test could be if the readability makes a bigger difference um, for less experienced people or newer accountants. Um, so basically you can try to maybe interact the readability index and the years of experience to see if the impact of readability is different for people with different number uh, years of experience. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we will do that for sure. Thank you indeed. Philip, can you just keep it in memory? <laughs> Eduardo, and then we finish this session. I was about to say the same thing. Like it's a it's a penalty the model may want, may want to consider some of these effects or something to take into account the complexity of the regulation and how new is the regulation. I was about to say exactly the same thing, but just the same fixed effect. <laughs> <laughs> Ludwig, do you want to say something? Yes, please. Yes, uh, I totally agree with the, with the points made. Uh, uh, and actually, it's an, uh, as a re recommendation, this is this very important study. Uh, what you have is, is kind of, you're illustrating a learning curve. Uh, the, I mean, you, you are pointing out the, 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 what is the stage which is expected, I mean, in, 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 any, in any implementation, manual implementation. I mean, there are the guys who have experience who will deal better with the new information or, or deal better with, with how to read this kind of manuals. And I think that the, this, this learning curve or, or, or linear per se mechanisms could, could, be, could, could be useful in this literature, mainly for the recommendation because you, you actually have a kind of of prior prioritization of the subjects to 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 be uh, where there is a, a lot of actually disagreement right now. These are this table. What there there is some some chapters. There they are uh, uh, quite understandable for them, and there are chapters that are more uh, challenging. So you have to prioritize those. In, in, a, in a learning uh, strategy, uh, uh, something like that. Yeah, this, is the, this was the first way how we use it, these data collected in order to support the treasury and road bank in improving, uh, because today they, are, they have just issued, not today, some months ago, uh, the ninth edition of the handbook and they are, we are working, I help them, we work with them, then work on the 10th edition. So we suggested, let's enhance our efforts on improving the readability and understandability of those chapters that are on the bottle. Because those that they already understand pretty well, better not to change that much, otherwise they will get confused. Uh, isn't it, Ricardo, what we discussed with Leo and the colleagues from the treasury? So just to finish, the main takeaway, just read it and then we finish. Uh, there is a correlation between the characteristics of the handbook and its readability, and also between the characteristics of the handbook and the users perceiving how they understand it. Uh, so how can the treasury improve the handbook? Uh, as Ludwig was already suggesting, 
the text should be organized, consider indicated structure to improve readability with examples, charts, and uh, sub items. Professional experience time should be considered uh, in the by the treasury in somehow, for example, a basic and advanced handbook, or even separating it into topics, similar to what we do in undergrad programs. We have accounting 101, intermediary accounting, advanced accounting. Hmm, should we try to organize the should the treasury try to organize the the chapters within the handbook? Uh, with the basics of the issue and then some more advanced topics within the same handbook. I don't know, as we do in textbook, in, in, in teaching, any material. And third, public bodies should compose the accounting team with more and less experienced professionals in order to have the diversity and the learning curve be improved in that regard. So, well, that's it that we have so far. This is still a working process. Uh, I thank a lot for the comments. And I think time, how, how, what time is it, please? 36. Okay, we have four minutes. 26 or 36? Oh, we don't, we, we just passed some six minutes. So, do we have one single question so we could finish this presentation, move forward to Enrico? No question. So, thank you indeed. Ricardo, José Elias, Leonardo, and Felipe for this paper. And so, Enrico, are you with us? Yes. Oh, thank you. So now I'd like to, to invite Enrico to, to this discussion because uh, last month, wasn't it, in Coimbra, we met uh, for the last time, Enrico. And there was a very interesting this, uh, uh, workshop from the IRSPM, and we had the opportunity to discuss a little bit the future of public sector accounting research. And I thought, well, so many uh, ideas and thoughts about digitalization. And then I, I asked and invited Enrico to, to come to this colloquium today, and he kindly uh, accepted the invitation. Unfortunately, through Zoom, I hope next time we will be able to have a caipirinha together, but this time it's okay. So far, so good. So please, uh, Enrico, the way we organize this colloquium, as you saw, is not so formal. Uh, we try to keep it less formal as possible, so I will not read your bio. Uh, all the attendants can read the on the website where we have all the information about the presenters so professor enrico braccio from university of ferrara thank you indeed for your time and please the mic is yours thank you ricardo uh, for inviting me it's a it's a real pleasure uh i'll go uh through zoom but uh, we we all learn the value of uh, technologies uh, uh, after the, 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 the pandemic, and it is also a way to stay in contact. Next time, I promise, I'll um, in, in due course, I'll try to come around. That would be very lovely. And talking about technology, today, uh, I'm going to present some reflections. So I'm not presenting data. Uh, I'm not presenting particularly quantitative analysis, but some reflection that I've started to make uh, and that are based from a recent paper that I published in AAAJ, in Accounting Auditing Accountability Journal, where I uh, uh, reflected on um, the implications that the introduction of internet, uh, artificial intelligence in public service delivery uh, may have, and to some extent um, is already having uh, in terms of accountability. Um, so uh, I will sketch my, my presentation by reflecting on uh, the, uh, what do we mean by uh, artificial intelligence in public services? And uh, uh, most of all, the uh, the uh, drawbacks that 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 may be bring about 
but uh, and concluding with some uh, way out uh, in terms of uh, um, measures uh, that we can um, um, use in order to avoid the loopholes uh, in terms of accountability and some reflection on uh, future uh, uh, research opportunities uh, that uh, artificial intelligence in public service delivery may bring about. Um, the idea uh, for this um, uh, paper and uh, also from, for this presentation move from an, another piece of work uh, that I uh, made uh, uh, together with other colleagues in a special issue in financial accountability management, uh, where we speculate that, uh, uh, of course, moving from the, the fact that accountability in public service uh, is a, a foundation, a key element uh, uh, in the uh, also democratic um, democratic relationship uh, between citizens and uh, public service organization. And the fact that um, accountability is not uh, only um, uh, static, but is relational and dynamic and multidimensional. And um, we, um, there, there are studies in, on public, on the implication of accountability due to the technology uh, development in public services some of them are positive, some other are less positive, but there are very few studies looking at, at particular technology that is artificial intelligence, as, a, uh, as I said. And we speculate on that paper that um, um, technology a transition may bring about some accountability issue, but what type? And I decided to focus on artificial intelligence. First of all, what do we mean by artificial intelligence? The, someone uh, uh, says that, of course, artificial intelligence is an umbrella term, um, as uh, there are many te technologies, mainly um, in terms of data analysis, um, algorithm uh, um, that can uh, then uh, extrapolate that and produce outcome that are used. You, you can see here some of them, some of them that you also use in your research. And uh, uh, so they're not limited to public service are uh, tools that are currently used, uh, but in which what is changes is the different relationship between a human and algorithm. So artificial intelligence is deemed to change this interaction between human and, and uh, algorithm. That depends, of course, on the type of in artificial intelligence. As uh, nowadays, uh, is the artificial intelligence can be clustered in three main groups, uh, artificial narrow intelligence, uh, artificial general intelligence, artificial super intelligence. What we know nowadays are the first two, artificial narrow intelligence, artificial general intelligence, that are um, artificial intelligence that needs uh, some kind of human supervision or human role uh, in its functioning or its control. So uh, the uh, neural uh, uh, learning process or artificial neural learning or other type of uh, algorithm uh, are grouped in the first two uh, of these. Uh, but there is a coming uh, um, type of artificial intelligence that is called super intelligence, where uh, artificial intelligence system can become fully autonomous or almost uh, so. And uh, in a, a, the distinction is always how much delegation we give to we uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So why it is relevant when we talk about artificial intelligence in public services posing the problem for accountability? Of course, in this human and algorithm delegation, uh, there is the risk of creating some responsibility loopholes uh, and or some uh, uh, responsibility voids 
or also um, the risk of um, uh, lack of transparency of uh, scrutability of the whole decision-making process. Um, but apart from the different types of artificial intelligence, a definition of artificial, in artificial intelligence that I found very uh, relevant for uh, um, the context of public services uh, is the one that defines artificial intelligence, not just from a technological point of view, but on its uh, function and uh, on how it relates to human as well. Uh, so artificial intelligence can be uh, defined as a reservoir or smart agency. That means that uh, it uh, support and trigger the, uh, the, some human activity. So it provides human with more agency to perform better uh, uh, or with an improved performance a certain task. Uh, Anani uh, defines artificial intelligence as an assemblage of human and non-human actors. So it means that we uh, need always to take into consideration that in the uh, process of uh, using, implementing artificial intelligence, we need not to forget that artificial intelligence does not exist per se, uh, and is not intelligent per se, but exists because there is a, a new a human interaction. Um, Someone may, may say, uh, uh, is it uh, artificial intelligence in public services already there, or it's something in the foreseeable future or in a very far away future? Here, um, uh, you can see some recent data uh, from the Observatory for Artificial Intelligence in the European Union. Uh, where we can see that there is a, a steep increase in the last couple of years of uh, uh, cases of uh, 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 diffusion and application of uh, artificial intelligence in public service delivery uh, in, in across, across countries. Of course, there are more advanced countries on that respect, like the Netherlands, as you can see. Uh, but also Portugal, Italy, Estonia. Uh, I don't know, of course, the, I don't have data about uh, uh, South America and Brazil in particular, but it's something that is coming, is coming forward. And of course, um, when we talk about artificial intelligence and technology, uh, we always said the good and the bad. Um, in a sense that, of course, uh, is a technology, and as always, as a technology is promoted and is used based on the um, um, hypothesis that it will bring a more efficient and effective uh, public service uh, in terms of decision making or outcome overall outcome. Uh, and we have examples in the literature. The, here you find one in which. Artificial intelligence can provide uh, uh, and support for improving public services. But at the same time, we have a, a growing set of cases and uh, a, a publication related to uh, scandals or uh, what we would call uh, unintended consequences, uh, negative consequences in the use of artificial intelligence. Here you have an example of the Dutch tax authority uh, that use an algorithm in order to detect fraudulent uh, uh, tax declaration, and uh, uh, but it was biased, and that of course uh, affected the life uh, of many families, also with children. Uh, and uh, we have other examples around the world about negative, unintended consequences. So there is. Um, here, the, um, the reflection about the fact that the introduction, the introduction of artificial intelligence uh, uh, does not provide uh, necessarily um, the intended um, outcome, but it needs to be assessed and in order to avoid the unintended consequences. But when things goes, go, go well, everything, everybody's happy. When, when things go bad, then of course there is a matter of uh, accountability. So who is responsible for what uh, and what are the consequences for uh, that? And um, 
when we um, need to consider an algorithm applied in a public service co uh, context, of course, uh, it uh, emerges that there are uh, an algorithm, of course, but there are also different actors that are involved, decision makers that are those that make the decision to introduce artificial intelligence systems. There are designers, so uh, uh, engineering uh, uh, or other experts that design the system. And in most cases, the designers are not uh, uh, public service uh, servant managers, but are uh, private companies providing the, um, the algorithm and, and the overall system. Um, and then we have the users. So public servants, uh, public managers uh, that then use the data produced by algorithm uh, and make their own decisions and to reach some outcomes. So in all this process, of course, there is a problem of uh, a distributed responsibility has the uh, outcomes that, that are uh, achieved, of course, are the uh, uh, result of the different roles and things can go wrong or needs to be, people needs to be accounted for, for different responsibility, decision maker, designers, users, but also algorithm in terms of uh, their e e e explicability. And um, um, when artificial intelligence is in place, what is happening is a distribution of responsibility throughout the decision-making process. And this may dilute the responsibility chain uh, in the, then be accountable for the outcomes achieved in terms of outcome achievement, trust and legitimacy, uh, service delivery quality, efficiency, and of course, overall uh, uh, accountability, accountability system. Um, A delegation, as we said, of responsibility uh, when uh, uh, artificial intelligence is in place. And um, uh, I found very interesting this concept of missing masses drawing by, uh, from Latour, uh, discussing about uh, the delegation from human to a non-human, so a technologies in particular. Uh, Latour makes this a very simple example uh, of uh, um, a, a door uh, that can be open or closed by a human, or we may decide to delegate uh, uh, the opening and the closing of the door to a technology. That is a very simple example, but uh, in, uh, the, in designing the functioning and the delegation uh, to the machine, we need to define some prescription of delegation. And prescription uh, refers to the moral and ethical dimensions uh, uh, on the way in which technology need to function. And the delegation does not free human uh, from the responsibility and the moral consequences uh, of uh, then the functioning of, of the technology. And the missing masses uh, represent uh, the uh, potential responsibility voids, that is the, then the uh, accountability gaps uh, that may, may derive. And uh, I also uh, here um, uh, present the, this reference by Guns and Tor in a recent publication. And they also uh, consider the risk of this responsibility gap when uh, uh, some function is delegated to a technology. And in this case, um, the artif artificial intelligence um, in public service in public service delivery. And um, talking about um, then artificial intelligence and accountability, more uh, more in particular, um, there are it, it emerges at least the three ethical challenges that needs to be taken into account in the way we design the accountability system in a, a public service uh, um, uh, public service delivery when artificial intelligence is involved. We may refer to 
uh, some um, moral awareness. So artificial intelligence affects moral uh, awareness and we need uh, moral awareness is the moment in which uh, we decide whether or not a certain situation or decision contains some moral content. And so we need to consider the fact that there, there are some ethical or moral issues that things uh, uh, bring about, uh, the event bring about. Then uh, we have a problem of moral motivation uh, to assess whether a morally correct decision will have consequences on the self, uh, so on, on the individual, but also on the machine. This is important for the design of um, the values uh, uh, that uh, and the rules for an uh, artificial intelligence algorithm. That refers, refers back to the Asimov's uh, uh, robotic rule, just to give an example, a, a film, uh, filmmaking example, uh, but that's to, to ascertain the fact that we we may there, there is a moment in every decision making process and we identify there there are some moral issues. Uh, a, a morally correct decision may have consequences on the on the subject, and also uh, the fact that um, that giving the um, an authority power in the decision making process uh, um, may uh, then affect the behavior uh, of, uh, of a human. And in this case, when uh, an artificial intelligence system is in place, will it affect uh, uh, public managers, public servants in their behavior? Uh, and so all these, um, ethical challenges uh, open up what I uh, speculate are additional accountability gaps uh, in public service delivery when artificial intelligence is in place. And I identify those responsibility gaps uh, uh, along the three accountability phases, the informational phase, that is the moment in which then uh, information are given, uh, about a decision-making process or the, the result uh, of a, a certain um, um, uh, event um, by the account uh, account giver. So it it uh, it is very similar to the concept of transparency, explanation, and answer answerability. Uh, that is the uh, function to provide an explanation for the result, the outcome and the way, uh, the, the reason for a certain decision. And of course, consequences as an accountable subject needs to bear also the consequences for the results. So in terms of also of positive or negative consequences. So what type of accountability gaps uh, artificial intelligence public services can bring about? In terms of informational phase, uh, one gap is the uh, lack of clarity in terms of uh, who is responsible. Um, that, of course, can be solved in terms of clarifying the uh, responsibility uh, chain, but that may create responsibility gaps. So in designing the um, arti artificial intelligence system in public services, uh, uh, the risk of a responsibility gap may emerge. At the same time, uh, uh, algorithm opaqueness, uh, unscrutability uh, may also create a gap in uh, providing information. What do we mean by algorithm opaqueness? Uh, there are two types of uh, um, what is called black box situation for algorithm. One is proprietary black box and the other is technical black box. Proprietary black box refers to the fact that uh, um, many uh, artificial intelligence system are provided by private uh, companies that may have some commercials uh, secret or they are not uh, um, open to, um, to disclose the functioning of the algorithm. And there are also some technical black box in terms that there, there are some more advanced uh, algorithm, uh, um, the outcomes of which are not uh, uh, understandable even by te the, uh, technician, by engineering, 
as um, as we know, artificial intelligence uh, have a self-learning process producing artificial data. And so there are some technical issues in order to understand uh, the outcomes of a certain uh, system, artificial intelligence system. We have other gaps in the explanation and answerability phase in terms of output explanation. Public managers may not be able to explain why an artificial intelligence system came out with a certain uh, 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 response or a certain data. Uh, and that, of course, creates some problem for explanation as reliability. There is a problem of automation, automation bias uh, by public managers in terms of behavior. Uh, there are two types of automation bias, acceptance through ignorance and induced automation acceptance. That is uh, the fact that uh, managers may not know uh, the functioning of artificial intelligence system, and so they accept it by ignorance. So they take it as true without uh, making any, any type of critical reflection. And there is also a risk of induced automation acceptance in terms of uh, public managers also for um, uh, efficiency, just take what the artificial intelligence system provides as, as result and use it without any particular reflection. And also, there is a risk of public value values displacements. Uh, algorithm function to be efficient. That means that the designer has to define some uh, uh, prioritization in terms of values. For instance, between uh, uh, timeliness and accuracy, that's uh, uh, an example. So uh, if an algorithm prefer uh, timeliness rather than accuracy, then the result may be very different. So the uh, values that are uh, innerly designed through the system, of course, may create difficult in uh, making answerable and explainable. Uh, finally, in the consequences phase, we may have some accountability gaps in terms of uh, uh, uncontestable artificial intelligence decisions. Uh, in terms that no one has the power to uh, the context because they're not understandable. So uh, it's very difficult to then assess who should bear the consequences for the uh, negative or positive uh, result, particularly for the negative, of course. And also actors' de defendiveness in the sense that uh, public managers may refute responsibility uh, given the fact that there is uh, an, an algorithm providing the data, creating some um, other behavioral uh, consequences, imbearing the, the, the uh, responsibility and then the consequences in the uh, account giving uh, uh, process. Uh, how we can, can we uh, then try to solve these accountability gaps? So uh, try to uh, move forward uh, and uh, try to uh, uh, detect some way forward. Uh, or given that uh, 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 as, uh, every time there is a technological innovation, public services need needs to in innovate. But we need to be aware of also how to address some of these po potential drawbacks in terms of accountability. And moving from the fact that uh, accountability um, um, are an artificial intelligence system is an assemblage of human and human actors that is relational, is contextual, is dynamic because uh, artificial intelligence algorithm changes over time because they have a self-learning process. So they are not static in that sense and is a processual in its nature. Um, I, draw, I, I draw from the distinction made by Roberts 2009, this, uh, distinguishing between transparency accountability and intelligent accountability, where transparency and accountability reflects to the um, more formal, um, uh, measurable type of accountability, uh, where then things can be predefined, uh, can be measured uh, before and in a typical uh, principal agent relationship. Uh, whereas intelligent accountability uh, move from the fact that um, yeah, it's impossible to achieve a fully transparent self uh, 
and it's not enough to see inside, but it's important to see across, which means that it's important that the, the whole uh, process is accountable and where then uh, there is uh, a more informal, relational, dialogical accountability process. And moving from the fact that we need to then address the uh, artificial intelligence accountability from an intelligent perspective, um, we can identify um, at least four uh, ways in which then we can try to avoid the accountability gaps when artificial intelligence is involved. The first and foremost point is uh, to um, implement what I propose is an accountability governance or of artificial intelligence in public services based on uh, participation, uh, dialogical interaction among actors, uh, and where we can have both a proactive and a reactive accountability approach, where a, a proactive accountability approach means identify by design the ways in which uh, um, accountability should be performed for an, an artificial intelligence system, but then uh, also to be reactive in order to monitor the actual implementation of the intelligent, artificial intelligence system, to monitor and to identify potential biases of the system and to correct the biases in order to improve the way in which artificial intelligence system public service delivery function, and then to make it accountable to uh, the different uh, um, uh, account old holders. And then it refers back to the concept of accountability as a virtue and as a, also as well as a, uh, as a, as a, me a mechanism. So accountability governance, first of all, as, uh, which means uh, taking in, on board uh, citizens uh, or other actors, the designer of, uh, uh, um, of the uh, um, artificial intelligence system, the designer, and of course, public managers and a public servant. Uh, there are also other ways in which we can avoid the accountability gaps I described. Uh, some are more technical, like explainable artificial intelligence systems uh, that are uh, technical ways in which I can uh, um, explain the, the, ways in, uh, the ways in which that decision, that outcome uh, was produced uh, to make it more transparent. Uh, algorithm audits. The European Union uh, is developing some regulation uh, in order to make it compulsory the, um, uh, the, um, the presence of some external independent uh, algorithm audits uh, in order to identify uh, biases and in its functioning and uh, impact assessment in order to assess the cost benefit of this implementation in public service uh, organization, because at the end of the day, of course, our cost uh, investment. So we always need to decide whether the um, implementation of an artificial intelligence system will, uh, uh, of course, provide more value than the cost and also the potential uncertainties that that system may bring about in a very a uh, very, um, uh, uh, so to say, uh, crucial public services like security, uh, uh, like law enforcement uh, or uh, that type of uh, public services. And going toward the conclusion of my uh, intervention, uh, some agenda uh, for um, algorithm in government, what, what I said, that um, I think public service um, um, accounting and accountability scholars should in the near future uh, look at. Um, there is an issue on how uh, the accountability of um, artificial intelligence affect government leg legitimacy, 
and of course also public service legitimacy. There is a risk again that the introduction of artificial intelligence may reduce the legitimacy that citizens perceive uh, towards uh, the government, and that is a, 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 an aspect that needs to be uh, uh, understood, better understood and analyzed. Uh, in my speech, I uh, talk about accountability in a very general terms, but we know that there are different types of accountabilities. Political accountability, public accountability, managerial professional accountability. So we know very little about the implications and the effects of artif artificial intelligence uh, when political accountability is involved, public accountability, managerial professional accountability are involved. So I, uh, um, I can see that, of course, the implications are different. Uh, and then uh, a more a specific focus of analysis would be worthwhile. Um, our algorithm accountability and public values. Uh, in the design of artificial intelligence systems, we also need to take into consideration what type of public values the um, artificial intelligence system will uh, um, put forward, prioritize or not. And of course, that's something that needs to be considered as we know that public values is a, a key component of uh, public service delivery with respect to the market. And that needs to be then um, analyzed. The role of accountants and auditors, controllers uh, in uh, all the process, of course, when accountability is involved, there, the, there must be someone providing a, an account. So on that respect, of course, artificial intelligence may bring about uh, implications and, and changes. To be, uh, to be addressed. Um, of course, uh, accountability uh, and artificial intelligence can also be analyzed in a more, I would say, critical aspect. There are studies uh, uh, posing some, uh, I would say, more um, uh, negative uh, perception uh, and risk in the diffusion of artificial intelligence, uh, reflecting on the concept of uh, algocracy, uh, that uh, is um, a, a governance system based on artificial intelligence algorithm, and where governments can use artificial intelligence for new ways of counting, uh, uh, sorting, and scoring of citizens, uh, ref uh, referring to the, the concept of governmentality. Uh, of Foucault and applied uh, in a much more uh, advanced technological context uh, as artificial intelligence. But we, we don't have to wait too much because we know how already ch the China gov Chinese government is using uh, face recognition or other artificial intelligence systems in order to uh, pursue um, much more fine-grained control of uh, individual and population. So that's, of course, is something in democratic uh, countries that is uh, something to be um, 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 look at uh, with particular attention. And last but not least, um, um, artificial intelligence uh, system in public services, of course, uh, ref, um, needs to be referred to the, the concept of co-production. Uh, as I said, co-production we know is a, a really well-defined concept, but with artificial intelligence, of course, uh, the role of citizens uh, becomes even more important to provide legitimacy, to provide also more accountability, and uh, to guarantee that the result of the um, new design service fits the um, requirements, the needs, and avoid the biases that uh, an artificial intelligence system may bring about uh, uh, if implemented uh, critically uh, and without uh, uh, a, a governance system. Um, and to conclude, um, uh, 
when we talk about artificial intelligence, uh, we have in mind that there is a robot doing everything we need, uh, but uh, as uh, we are reflecting, uh, we need to always have in mind that artificial intelligence um, requires an interaction with a human. And so it is important that we don't abdicate our intelligence to some technical intelligence. Thank you for your time and I'm open for questions, uh, uh, reflection, uh, ideas also, or maybe uh, interest that you may have in, in this type of topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hick, for your very interesting presentation. Uh, and just to keep on your last slide, there is a, a un unintended defect of this, the usage of IA and digitalization, like the de-skilling. Once we delegate to the machine much of our decision, or at least our memory, we don't use that that much as we used to do before. Uh, my, I can talk by myself. I don't know the telephone number of many of my relatives because they are on my mobile agenda. While, while, while I was a kid, I knew pretty immediately the phone numbers of my parents, uh, their they works and their phone home and so on and so forth. Actually, I don't know even my phone number for home uh, because I don't call that. Uh, outside from my mobile. So thank you for uh, this discussion. Pretty, pretty interesting, pretty relevant. And now I was to ask the audience for questions. Yes, Philippe, please. So very interesting presentation. Thank you, Professor. And you showed us some path to try to fill these gaps that comes with the usage of artificial intelligence. But is, uh, my, my question is, is there some gap that we potentially cannot fill in any way since the artificial intelligence as we are restricted now to this general and narrow intelligence, uh, the knowledge comes from the database we use. And as you showed us, there are some bias and, and other, other aspects and sometimes we are uh, in real life we, we deal with the unexpected and unseen data and we have to react immediately without knowing no, without previous knowledge so can artificial intelligence fill this gap is it possible or is it something we are going to have to deal with it Thank you for this uh, relevant and interesting question. Uh, so um, I answer in two ways. Uh, one way is that uh, I think uh, we can uh, address uh, all of those accountability gaps um, in the sense that uh, um, we have the means and we have the intelligence to do that. Uh, to the other expect, uh, to the to the other part is that uh, uh, can we make it? Uh, that of course uh, is more problematic. Uh, we know already that uh, um, the accountability in public services is not perfect at all. So uh, yeah, and so it, it is going very very unlikely that uh, uh, with artificial intelligence will uh, uh, improve. Uh, given that uh, uh, there is no um, uh, particular attention on accountability. So to some extent, there is a lot of work to be done in public service accountability without artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence will com complicate even more and make it in even more difficult. So to some extent, yes, in theory, uh, that the way in which I try in my paper to, uh, to uh, discuss, uh, it is uh, uh, feasible, it is manageable to, to avoid those responsibility gaps. Uh, then, of course, um, moving from uh, theory, so to say, to practice, uh, that uh, I'm, 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 I'm a bit more skeptical, uh, given that sometimes, as we know, public service um, organizations tend to follow uh, uh, some fad and fashion. So someone may implement artificial intelligence 
because it's fashionable without uh, taking into consideration the uh, implications. So uh, that, of course, is uh, one of the major risks. That's why I think we have a role uh, in uh, um, posing uh, these problematics uh, into the debate uh, in order to um, avoid those negative consequences. Of course, technology can also be the solution. As I, as I said, uh, we have this explainable uh, artificial intelligence uh, algorithm that can uh, support in order to um, make it more transparent the way in which artificial intelligence functions. So uh, that is something that, uh, that uh, engineer uh, are working. Uh, and uh, as I said, the um, European Union is uh, regulating the diffusion of artificial intelligence, uh, moving from uh, most of the uh, problematics that I underline. Thank you. Thank you, Henrico. It's interesting that uh, Professor Miklos that from Huntington University that has organized this colloquium uh, with me since the first year in 2016 used to say, technology gives, that te technology takes. And it, that's for sure a reality. And as you are saying, on one hand, on the previous, the second previous slide that you just presented on the bottle, there were the, the issue of surveillance and surveillance on the one hand on, and co-production on the other. So we could talk about the opportunities for armchair auditors uh, so surveilling the government activities due to digitalization and some appliances and solutions provided by IA uh, as a way to, as a matter of co-production in this regard. But on the other hand, we uh, make our data scrutinized by government and many others, and we never know how others will use data about ourselves and so on. Fortunately, we are not that interesting, so they will not monitor us as we, so, we were. So far, at least, so far. Yes, but now I have time for one last question. Eduardo, uh, I said that, yes, one last, because uh, Mauricio and Fabrizio are already here. Just one more question, please. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. And uh, it's, it's a question slash comment slash worry so it's in this range yeah so um in the presentation um was very clear to me how uh, important it is to to uh, uh define responsibilities and understand the effects of each of the of the ai methods or or uh process everything that you use ai but um one thing that i i was trying to get, get my mind around is that sometimes we don't really understand the effects of AI until uh, we really interact with them. And uh, it, uh, a, a few very good examples are social networks and search engines, um, targeted ads and things like that. You, previously we thought, okay, so what's the big issue of directing ads or directing comments and directing the posts of people you, who interact more or people who are similar to you. And then we already found out that, well, there may be very big consequences. People, you have this, uh, you have this uh, loop that you end up leaving whatever that runs through. People end up having, uh, like separating, cannot separate social life, online social life to physical social life, things like that, that have effect in society. So um, my question slash, <laughs> worry is that how can we think about these things? How can we uh, uh, attack these problems before they're actually a problem? Because um, for what you said is, is more like a preventive for things that won't really have this forward loop, this backward loop that, I mean, mm -hmm. this cycle of madness. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um... I, I, the answer is that um, that goes one of the things that I, I mentioned during the, during the presentation, the fact that uh, 
uh, when artificial intelligence is involved, of course, it is very difficult to um, pre-design everything and to uh, make sure that the outcomes, the eventual outcomes, will uh, will be uh, free of biases or and uh, unintended consequences. Therefore, the the only way is to implement the system of what, of what I call of proactive and reactive accountability approach. That means from the one side, uh, trying to design the system. Uh, in, a, in a way in which we try to adapt to making uh, um, as best as possible to avoid unintended consequences through pretesting uh, uh, and uh, by design. Uh, to the other extent, we cannot be uh, uh, sure 100% uh, that uh, uh, no unintended consequences on the behavior or on the quality of data uh, that we have as input uh, may, 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 may bring about. So we need to have a reactive accountability approach. That means having a, a governance system monitoring the actual use of artificial intelligence systems in order to detect uh, as soon as possible uh, pitfalls, uh, unintended consequences, and intervene uh, uh, as soon as possible in order to reduce is a kind of risk management system to some extent, uh, as in, in, uh, as a new, very new technology, and the fact that uh, uh, some of the advancement uh, of artificial intelligence are tools that uh, evolves. So you may design a system, but then it evolves. It evolves through time because uh, it uh, it learns through the data. So we and always need to be in the condition to monitor uh, the actual functioning uh, in order to intervene to be reactive. So I don't know whether I answer or not to, to your question, but uh, um, uh, uh, that's my view. Oh, no, you did, you did in part. I mean, the metrics to which, how you measure that is a completely different question. But uh, yeah, it, it, you answered, but just uh, one, Comment on that. Uh, so, when I think about that, because when you showed the example of the door, I was thinking that if you use the wrong metrics and you analyze the wrong things, you may just develop a door that will just open once a day or twice a day, and that's it. So, I mean, yeah. it can be exactly. more efficient just to leave things closed. And that's that's when you need the intervention. That's what that's why you need to be to measure things accurately. Accurately. Anyway, yeah, definitely. Anyway, and, and you need to define the, the values, the, the, the moral priority. That's why, uh, of course, they, there are um, large studies or on ethical uh, uh, standards for artificial intelligence. There is a, a very wide debate. And of course, that's fundamental. Uh, but that's in the design of the system. But as I said, we can have the best uh, designers uh, and make the uh, highest effort in having the best design as possible. But at the end of the day, we need to monitor. And so to have, as I said, an accountability system governance. Thank you. Thank you, Enrico. Thank you, the audience, for questions and comments. Uh, now we need to move to the next panel that is Fabrizia and Mauricio. Uh, Fabrizio, are you here with us? So thank you again, Enrico, to please help me. Acknowledging participation. Thank you for, for having me. Uh, and the next presentation will be about a smart contract research performed in South Cat Santa Catarina. Isn't it, Mauricio? Olá, só um minuto, Ricardo. Acho que eu agora estou com um problema aqui na minha câmera. Só um minutinho que a câmera não está abrindo. Ok. É, Maurício... Who share the screen? Maurício <laughs> or Fabrício? Or do you want me to, to present the slides from here? Ah, é, eu já vou apresentar então aqui o slide enquanto isso. A gente vai fazendo a conversa enquanto eu tento arrumar a minha câmera. <laughs> ok. Ok. There you go. We already see your screen. Yes. Ok. Yes, that's fine. Um, 
É, então, para não atrasar muito, eu vou fazer a apresentação. Me desculpa, é, Ricardo, em português. Tudo bem? Fique à vontade, como você preferir. Ah, ok. Então, um bom dia a todos. Né? Eu agradeço a oportunidade. Eu e o Maurício Lírio. O Maurício ele tem a sua formação aqui na Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina e atua no governo do estado de Santa Catarina e vem conosco aí é, como parceiro de atividades, né? junto à equipe do professor Miklos. E, e a ideia dessa apresentação é justamente, no primeiro momento, apresentar a contribuição né, dessas parcerias, incluindo com o professor Ricardo, da FGV, para potencializar a temática aqui dentro é, né, do nosso país, junto com e, e auxiliar no processo de formação, não apenas para os nossos alunos, mas também é, para, para as pessoas que, direta ou indiretamente, estão conosco nos projetos. Né? Então, o que nós estamos trazendo do Smart Contracts é uma experiência que nós tivemos é com o governo do estado de Santa Catarina. É, Para falar um pouco, um pouco, antes de falar exatamente dessa experiência, gostaria de compartilhar com vocês é, é, essa parceria com a Huttger e o professor Miklos, como ela tem é, se dado e que resultados isso tem é, trazido é, para nós nessa forma de trabalhar né, a parceria é, com a, o professor Miklos e sua equipe da Huttgers, com outras entidades, né, principalmente aí, é, entidades governamentais, como o governo do estado de Santa Catarina, e a Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina, e as outras universidades, como a FGV, que sempre é parceira, é, e tem potencializado também o conhecimento, né? Então, para nós aqui, inicia com o professor Maurício Codesso, que hoje permanece nos Estados Unidos, o professor Rogério, é, lá em 2016 e ainda está em continuidade, quando o Maurício vai fazer o seu doutorado junto com o professor Miklos, né? o doutorado sanduíche. Na sequência, eu fui participar do WCAR e a gente traz o WCAR para o Brasil. Por que, que eu comento isso? Né? Aqui se estabeleceu a parceria não só com é, a equipe do professor Miklos, mas também o professor Ricardo, também outras universidades aqui é, do Brasil, é, como a de Salvador, por exemplo, e a partir dali, essas parcerias, né? não foi apenas com o governo do Estado, mas Marinha do Brasil, ou prefeituras, né? isso tem auxiliado tanto o processo de formação dos é, doutores aqui, é, né, que fazem doutorado conosco aqui em Santa Catarina, quanto é, com a própria comunidade, é, a sociedade em si, é, que vem é, nos receber com esses projetos. Né? E o WCAS ele tem sido esse network muito importante e que é, tem mudado muito a forma em que nós estamos... É, auxiliando o processo de formação em um doutorado. Em 2020, um outro doutorando, é, nessa mesma linha de atuação da Marcelo Freitas, também foi para a Huttgers e desenvolveu sua tese né, sobre auditoria contínua, também com o governo do estado de Santa Catarina. E a defesa do Marcelo ele acontece junto com o WCARS que aconteceu esse ano, né? depois aí da parada por causa da pandemia. E, com isso, é, essa forma de trabalhar, e também nesse período de pandemia exclusivamente, trabalhamos com alguns projetos né? sobre smart contract, que o Maurício vai é, abordar para vocês. Então, um contrato direto do, entre o governo e as universidades, é, transparência, auditoria e monitoramento contínuo. Então, são projetos que a gente envolve, primeiramente, essa parceria né, com o professor Miklos, estabelece um é, produto a ser entregue é, para uma entidade em si. E por que, que eu ressalto que isso é importante? O processo de formação 
muda muito. Né? Então, o desenvolvimento entre as duas equipes, das duas universidades, é, com a, uma equipe é, do governo, tem alterado muito o formato é, dos nossos trabalhos. Né? Então, eles continuam até hoje, e essa equipe é, de apoio da Rutgers tem sido muito importante para nós, né? aqui da, da UFSC, e a mesma coisa acontece com as outras universidades aqui é, do Brasil. Né? É, o, o, o Ricardo sempre é muito parceiro né? também conosco em relação a isso, apoiando, apoiando também o WCARS, é, vem para Florianópolis, traz aí as suas contribuições, né? Exatamente na pesquisa que a gente é, vai demonstrar, e o Maurício, na sequência, vai apresentar para vocês, é, é com o foco em Smart Contract, e, é, primeira, e essa parceria entre a Rutgers, né, com essa visão da equipe do professor Miklos, da Auditoria e Monitoramento Contínuo, é, a minha equipe ela entra muito mais com essa ideia né, dessa estrutura é, pra, de olhar para o governo, e é, com o Maurício Lírio, essa aproximação com o campo de aplicação. Né? No estudo em si, é, foi-se é, o desenvolvimento desse framework, para né, no primeiro momento, a definição é, do smart contract, as plataformas utilizadas e as especificidades do setor, para definir, então, o objeto de análise que o Maurício já vai trazer para vocês, especificamente do que, que se tratou em termos de compras públicas, e a proposta, o protótipo. Né? O desenvolvimento, então, esse escopo foi em materiais básicos e o processo de desenvolvimento se focou aí para desenvolver análises de desafios e potencialidades antes mesmo do protótipo. Tudo isso foi desenvolvido né, com a, a parceria aí, é, de, de mais pessoas da equipe do professor Miklos. E o que destaco é justamente essa forma de trabalho, né? essa organização, é, pessoal da, da equipe do Miklos atuando diretamente com o pessoal da universidade e dos governos para desenvolver protótipos, para pensar em tecnologias, alterando aí bastante a forma de trabalho nosso aqui para o desenvolvimento é, das teses. Né? E, e aí, então, eu passo a palavra para o Maurício para ele apresentar esse desenvolvimento desse estudo em si, né? do Smart SC. Maurício... Eu vou parar o compartilhamento para ele compartilhar e se sentir mais à vontade no tempo dele, ok? Obrigado, Fabrícia. Pessoal, vocês estão me ouvindo bem? Estão me ouvindo, pessoal? Eu ouço. O Ricardo tá. ouve. Ricardo. Sim, estamos ouvindo, sim. Ah, obrigado. Então, é, primeiro agradecer a professora Fabrícia e também o convite para participar. É né? sempre um prazer estar junto com vocês aqui para compartilhar o que a gente tem feito no governo. É, e como a gente tem um tempo um pouquinho reduzido, é, a gente conversou e eu vou fazer uma rápida apresentação assim, do que, que a gente teve em termos do projeto, ali usando alguns slides, mas eu vou mostrar para vocês é, o que, que foi feito na prática. Tá? Então, acho que ficaria mais interessante também. É, quando a gente começou a trabalhar esse projeto, a nossa intenção, é, de uma forma mais ampla, foi a de criar uma plataforma de inteligência em contratações, né? Isso aí é, envolveria é, uma série de acordos de cooperação, né, sendo que o mais importante que a gente tem é esse com, pro, projeto com a equipe do professor Miklos e também a UFSC, né? e o que nós buscamos é fazer com que a gente tivesse um ambiente no qual a gente conseguisse embarcar uma série de aplicações ligadas à data science, à inteligência artificial e uso de smart contracts e blockchain, né? E a gente começou esse projeto todo junto com a equipe do Micros e fazendo um protótipo específico. Então, a gente saiu de uma proposta ampla né, de desenvolver uma plataforma de inteligência em governo e a gente afunilou isso para um caso de uso, que é o que eu vou apresentar para vocês aqui hoje. Tá? Mas, de forma geral, é, o que eu vou comentar aqui, ele envolve... Bom, só para vocês saberem, né, isso foi feito ali no âmbito da Diretoria de Gestão de Licitações e Contratos, tá? 
é, a gente tinha essa intenção, como está escrito aqui no título, de criar essa plataforma de inteligência, né? É, a ideia era, como eu comentei, de embarcar essas aplicações, mas eu vou passar aqui para alguns slides que eu creio que são mais importantes, tá? É, e aqui tem muito o escopo do projeto mais amplo, né? A gente usar Data Science e Analytics, por um lado, né? Buscando usar ferramentas de BI, Data Analytics, Machine Learning e outras, né? e também o desenvolvimento de aplicações descentralizadas baseadas em blockchain, e embarcar tudo isso aí dentro de uma plataforma, tá? É, essa parte do desenvolvimento da plataforma em si, a gente ainda está trabalhando, tá? Mas a gente já tem alguns produtos que vieram desse acordo com a Hutchins, que é o que eu vou focar mais aqui. É, aqui fala um pouco desse acordo, né? Depois eu vou mostrar melhor alguma coisa de infraestrutura, mas é, esse slide que eu acho importante a gente compartilhar agora, tá? É, a gente teve, dentro, desde o início, uma ideia de pensar a ideia de trabalhar a inteligência, mas também utilizando a ideia de dar transparência para tudo que está sendo feito, tá? e trabalhar numa lógica de cocriação e coparticipação, buscando universidades, a sociedade em si, né? para fazer com que esse processo inteiro seja bem perene e que tenha participação de todos. Né? É, até eu trouxe aqui embaixo essa frase, ela vem desse livro aqui, que é A Catedral e o Bazar, né? que é um livro que, do Raymond, mas essa frase é do Linus Toward, né? um dos criadores do Linux, e ela expressa bem a nossa ideia ali, que é essa, trabalhar com essa cultura de código aberto. Né? Inclusive, eu acho que o professor Brás comentou antes ali de é, algoritmos, uh, governo com algoritmos, né? e a gente fala muito também de dar transparência aos algoritmos, né? para que as pessoas possam entender o que, que tem ali embaixo do capô de alguns códigos, né? e possam participar, e auditar, e... e fazer o controle social também, tá? Então, a ideia sempre foi essa, né? A gente usar ferramentas que são de código aberto, a gente disponibilizar tudo que foi feito de uma forma que as pessoas possam acessar e reutilizar, né? E, especificamente, com relação ao protótipo, é, aqui tem um pouco do... Alguns slides, eu vou mostrar isso mesmo, tá? Aqui tem só uma apresentação dos slides, né? Eu não vou falar aqui também, discutir a parte da blockchain, mas eu queria falar sobre isso aqui, né? A gente trabalhou o que a gente chama de gestão da lista básica de materiais, tá? A lista básica de materiais do governo do Estado, ela é um processo que é feito uma licitação onde os fornecedores ganham o direito de vender produtos para o Estado em um determinado preço que fica acertado ali no processo licitatório, tá? Então, a gente começou o nosso trabalho na fase que é posterior ao processo de licitação, seria na execução do contrato. E a nossa intenção com a blockchain era fazer com que a gente tivesse um tracking de produtos desde o momento em que um servidor, um órgão de Estado solicita um material que compõe essa lista básica e passando por todas as etapas desse processo até o momento em que é feito o pagamento para o fornecedor. Tá? E a nossa ideia é que cada etapa dessa, desse processo vá sendo registrada em blockchain para que no final a gente tenha condições de criar uma fila de pagamento que seja é, imutável, né? Uma das nossas preocupações grandes é que existe, nesse momento de fazer o pagamento de fornecedores, existe uma discricionalidade grande pelos gestores do, dos órgãos, né? E se houver, por, é, porventura, algum gestor que seja, é, que tenha más intenções, né? Ele tem a possibilidade de usar essa, esse pagamento como uma forma de negociação, tá? Adiantar o pagamento de um fornecedor ou segurar o pagamento de um fornecedor e mediante propinas e negociações, né? Então, a, gente, a nossa ideia é de, dando transparência ao processo inteiro e também a gente colocando essa fila de pagamento em blockchain, ficaria muito mais complicado para que um gestor mal intencionado pudesse fazer alguma coisa no sentido de gerar um benefício próprio no momento de pagamento dos contratos, tá? É, eu, aqui está falando um pouco dos volumes de recursos envolvidos, né? Isso aí depois eu mostro para vocês também na no GitHub que a gente criou para isso, que eu acho que fica mais interessante, tá? É, aqui fala o que eu comentei, né? A ideia de gerenciar o fluxo de aquisições, o tracking. É, a gente tem essa intenção também de calcular saldo de atas e explicitar os momentos críticos desse processo de aquisição, tá? É, nós trabalhamos com duas tecnologias, principalmente. É, por um lado, a gente trabalhou com o Workflow Engine, tá? A gente trabalhando com o BPMS 2.0, então... A gente, por um lado, fez toda a modelagem desse processo. Aqui a gente, eu estou mostrando para vocês ali um slide que tem o, o modelo de processo que a gente adotou, tá? E a gente rodando isso em cima de um motor de workflow que é open source, que a gente instalou no servidor do, do governo do estado, né? E, por outro lado, a gente usando no back-end a, a blockchain para a gente implementar os smart contracts, né? Então, a gente tinha... Uma, uma, um framework que ele tinha, por um lado, né, a interface do usuário, a gente utilizou uma plataforma de workflow, que é essa plataforma chamada Camunda, tá? que é um, é um BPMS 
é, gratuito, e ali dentro a gente tem tanto a parte de modelagem de processos, como também a automação de processos por meio do motor de workflow que a, que a plataforma nos fornece. Né? Então, por um lado, a gente tem... Na, na camada de interface com o usuário, esse motor de workflow, essa plataforma que seria um BPMS, e no back-end a gente está trabalhando com uma rede blockchain, que no caso a gente trabalhou em cima da, da rede Ethereum, né? a gente usou é, uma rede de testes que é a Rinkeby, inicialmente a gente trabalhou com outra rede de teste que era a Hobster, né? a diferença entre as duas é que a Hobster é uma, uma rede que é prova de trabalho, né? para o favor, que a Rinkeby foi essa último fork que foi feito no Ethereum, que passou a ser prova de participação, que é o Proof of Stake. Né? Então, a gente acabou testando ali no decorrer do processo e nos dois ambientes, porque a gente teve essa mudança. Né? Então, a gente teve uma série de regras, que é de processamento dos contratos que ficaram dentro do motor de workflow, a gente tirou essas regras do, do blockchain, até para a gente fazer com que o custo do processamento ficasse mais baixo possível, né? E, a, e outras regras relativas ao pagamento, essas filas a gente colocou dentro do, da, do smart contract como, como algumas, alguns gatilhos ali, né? Então, a gente usou essas duas tecnologias, tá? É, aqui eu só estou mostrando um pouco das interfaces de usuário, então a gente tem ali uma série de formulários que são implementados dentro do motor de workflow, que o usuário vai fazer a solicitação do pedido, tá? E uma vez que é feita esse, esse, essa solicitação, a gente vai passando cada etapa usando o motor de workflow, né? É, aqui eu só estou mostrando também o momento em que, aqui no slide anterior, né, como vocês podem ver, a gente tem um pedido, né? O, o, o processo todo, ele se inicia quando é feita uma requisição de material, tá? Então, a gente faz a requisição de material, seleciona ali o fornecedor que é, que é o fornecedor que vende aquele tipo de material, e uma vez que é feita uma solicitação de fornecimento, a gente vai gravando cada uma dessas solicitações em blockchain. Né? Aqui no modelo a gente vê que a gente tem um layer aqui, que é a, a agência governamental que vai estar tá fazendo a solicitação, isso tudo aqui rodando no front-end, ali com formulários que são feitos e implementados nessa plataforma Camunda. A gente tem uma camada aqui que é de blockchain, né? onde a gente faz o registro de, de etapas que são chamadas críticas, então a gente tem um momento que é gravada a autorização de fornecimento, depois o momento que o fornecedor embarca o produto é gravado, caso o fornecedor não cumpra os períodos de 14 dias para a entrega de material, a gente grava essas penalidades também em blockchain, é, uma vez que o material é recebido, né? a gente faz, a, a, caso seja reprovado, isso é gravado, ou caso seja aprovado é também feito gravação, né? Então, isso aqui tudo mostra como que é feito o, o modelo com trabalho, tá? É, aqui, nesse caso, a gente está mostrando um, uma das tarefas que foi gravada em blockchain, tá? Então, a gente pode mostrar para vocês aqui o que que cada etapa dessa, a gente tem lá um, um hash, né? Que é um bloco que vai ser registrado no, na rede Ethereum, tá? Aqui a gente tem todas as informações sobre o pedido, né? Você vê aqui que a gente tem o número do pedido, o código, o endereço do, do, da agência, CNPJ da, da quem solicita, CNPJ de quem, quem compra, quem está fazendo a venda, né? o número do processo licitatório. Então, a gente vai registrando cada uma das informações em blockchain e vai gerando, vai gerando esse histórico dentro da rede Ethereum. Tá? É, aqui mostrando para vocês também da parte da interface do usuário, a gente tem aqui até essa versão do, do processo, tá? O modelo, ele é a primeira versão. Reparem que a gente teve no início um modelo bem mais simplificado, né? E à medida que nós fomos avançando no projeto, a gente foi é, modificando esse modelo de, de processo porque a gente precisava é, gravar etapas que inicialmente a gente não tinha incorporado, né? Então a gente tem nesse slide o que eu estou querendo mostrar para vocês é que uma vez que a gente usa essas duas tecnologias, né, o motor de workflow associado à blockchain e ao smart contract, a gente consegue fazer o monitoramento de todos os desses pedidos, né? E aqui eu estou mostrando para você um mapa de calor onde a gente pode acompanhar é, onde que está sendo passado, né, cada um dos pedidos e qual que é o caminho principal que ele faz, né? Então se, na, se a gente fosse adotar Voltando naquele modelo que é o final, a gente veria ali se, se, os, se os pedidos estão sendo reprovados por algum fornecedor, a gente veria que o mapa de calor iria dar um direcionamento para aquelas tarefas ali de gravação, de reprovação de pedidos, né? Então, isso facilita muito com que a gente acompanhe e entenda melhor o processo de compras, tá? É, e a gente também utiliza algumas métricas aqui de volume de, 
de processos que estão ocorrendo, tá? Então, a gente tem o um acompanhamento de cada um dos processos, a gente sabe cada uma das etapas, né? Se foi assinado pelo fornecedor, se foi enviado material, e aqui a gente tem um, um dashboard que nos, nos ajuda também a monitorar o volume de transações, por onde elas estão passando e assim sucessivamente, tá? É... Eu vou mostrar para vocês aqui o que, os códigos disso, porque eu acho que pode ficar mais interessante, né? É, eu passo os links também, né? Essa página aqui, pessoal, foi a página que nós criamos para o projeto, tá? Isso é uma landing page. Aqui na página inicial, a gente tem toda uma explicação aqui do que, que é o projeto, tá? Isso falando, justificando, né? Que o processo de contratação pública, ele tem esse caráter estratégico, então a gente utilizar as compras públicas de uma forma efetiva, isso pode, inclusive, fazer com que o governo ajude no desenvolvimento econômico e social do Estado, né? Porque a gente, o Estado é um grande comprador, né? O volume de compras que a gente faz, ele é muito grande. Então, aqui a gente tem toda uma discussão na página do que, que foi feito, tá? Isso aqui é a nossa lógica de dar transparência para todo o projeto, tá? É, aqui a gente tem também uma explicação de cada um dos acordos de cooperação técnica que a gente fez, então, aqui tem a, especificamente né, essa discussão do projeto que foi feito junto com a equipe da Rutgers, tá? É, aqui tem alguma explicação do projeto em si. É, nós criamos aqui essa parte, essas duas etapas aqui que eu acho mais interessante para a nossa discussão, tá? Na, na nossa landing page, nós criamos essa aba de casos de uso e a gente está documentando e disponibilizando para a sociedade tudo que vem sendo feito, tá? O que eu vou apresentar para vocês aqui é essa questão da gestão da lista básica de materiais, que foi... É, o que eu mostrei para vocês anteriormente ali nos slides, tá? É, isso aqui tudo está guardado em GitHub. Então, cada um dos projetos que a gente vai desenvolvendo, a gente vai criando um repositório em GitHub e vai abrindo esse código-fonte para que toda a sociedade tenha acesso a ele. Inclusive, a gente tem muita intenção de colocar também questões né, e desafios que a gente foi encontrando no meio do processo como issues para serem discutidas no GitHub, porque a gente consegue com que a comunidade de desenvolvedores acesse aquilo e nos possa vir a nos apoiar também na melhoria desses códigos e no desenvolvimento dessas aplicações, tá? Então, a gente tem dois casos que já estão em funcionamento hoje, né? Esse protótipo da gestão da lista básica. E, no caso, também a gente criou depois um outro, que é um robô que faz a busca de itens de materiais, mas isso aqui está no, tá no repositório também, mas não é o foco da discussão, tá? É, nós criamos também alguns dashboards, tá? Que a gente usa para monitoramento desses desses todas as compras do Estado, tá? Isso aqui também foi feito ali com a parceria junto com a Rutgers. É, ele está abrindo aqui, às vezes é um pouco lento, né? Porque a gente está fazendo filmagem ao mesmo tempo. Mas aqui a gente consegue acompanhar cada uma das compras do Estado, quem, foi, quem fez essa compra, e a gente pode filtrar aqui, né? O valor total que foi comprado, uma série de outras informações que ajuda também a divulgar o que está sendo feito e a gente pro, promover esse controle social em cima das ações, né? É, o que mais interessa para nós aqui, é, a gente criou essa conta aqui no GitHub, tá, gente? E aqui, nessa primeira parte aqui no Smart SC Governança, esse repositório, ele tem a documentação do acordo de cooperação que nós fizemos com a Rutgers, tá? E nós temos aqui tudo que foi tratado com eles, né? Aqui tem uma explicação de, do que, que a gente está fazendo, tá? E você acessando aqui os documentos, você pode ter acesso a a tudo que foi feito junto com as, as instituições com as quais a gente criou esses acordos de cooperação, tá? Aqui especificamente tem esse acordo com a Rutgers, tá? A gente tem alguns outros acordos que a gente fez também com o Banco Mundial, mas se vocês quiserem ter acesso e conhecer, aqui você tem toda o, a explicação, né? E, o, e como a gente descreveu esse acordo de cooperação, tá? É, no código aqui também, dentro desse repositório, é, a gente tem os dois repositórios, um que é o do robô que nós criamos, tá? que está aqui embaixo, que depois vocês podem ficar à vontade para acessar e conhecer, nós desenvolvemos usando a linguagem R, tá? E no caso da gestão da lista básica de materiais, esse repositório tem todo o, o protótipo que foi desenvolvido junto com a Rutgers, tá? É, a gente está sempre tendo o cuidado de dentro do repositório a gente fazer uma um resumo do que, que é isso, né? Então, a gente está falando aqui que esse é um repositório para automação dessa gestão da lista básica de materiais, né? Explicando a arquitetura aqui, tanto em termos de front-end quanto back-end, justificando por, o porquê, né? Que é importante, né? A gente fala do volume de recursos envolvidos no processo e aqui embaixo também quais são as premissas que a gente adotou no momento de desenvolver esse protótipo, né? O escopo do protótipo, o que, que a aplicação deve fazer e assim sucessivamente, né? É, até, professores, a gente tem também aqui uma versão em inglês, caso, como eu estou falando em português, né, para vocês entenderem também. Então, a gente tem toda aqui a explicação, né? E nesse repositório, 
vocês têm a possibilidade de navegar pelo código. Né? Então, aqui a gente montou isso. Temos aqui uma parte que tem os contratos, né? os, os smart contracts. Tá? Então, você acessando aqui, a gente tem todo o código em Solidity, que foi desenvolvido junto pra, pela equipe da Hutchings, tá? Aqui, sempre agradecendo a Jun, Kim e a Jun Dai, que nos apoiaram nesse processo. Então, a gente tem aqui o smart contract, que foi desenvolvido para a gente fazer o tracking dessa dessa solicitação de produto, tá? Então, isso é o, é o que a gente chama de back-end, né? Esse código solid, a gente implementou ele na rede de testes da Ethereum, né? Como eu mostrei para vocês no slide anterior, é, a gente, eu mostrei ali um dos blocos com a informação gravada na primeira, na primeira tarefa ali desse processo, tá? É, além disso, a gente tem aqui também é, os diagramas que foram construídos, tá? Então, a gente tem aqui os diagramas que são em formato do BPMN, tá? Esse aqui ele está no formato para implementação no motor de workflow, então é um, é um arquivo no formato BPMN que a gente implementa isso dentro da plataforma de workflow e conecta esse, esse material com, o, com a blockchain, tá? Aqui da mesma forma, vocês têm todo o código disponível aqui de tudo que foi feito, tá? Na, tanto na parte do front-end quanto no back-end. E... Também, assim, os formulários que foram desenvolvidos também, estão todos aqui disponíveis, tá? Os cinco formulários foram usados, né? Então, a gente tem um formulário no qual o servidor, ele faz a solicitação do material, uma vez que é feita a solicitação, o motor vai processar aquilo, identificar o fornecedor que vai fazer, uh, que compra aquele material, né? E depois a gente vai passando pelas etapas de registrar o despacho do produto, receber o material, aprovar e confirmar, né? Então, aqui também nós temos o código todo aberto para para quem quiser utilizar, tá? É, conhecer também o projeto. E criamos algumas tabelas dentro do motor de workflow, tá? Isso aqui são algumas tabelas de banco de dados relacional que nós montamos, que, como eu comentei, né? Uma parte da, da aplicação, ela roda off-chain, uma parte on-chain, né? Então, o processamento do que é na, na, dentro do motor de workflow, a gente criou aqui algumas tabelas de apoio que são implementadas dentro da, do banco de dados do Camunda, que é o nosso motor de workflow, tá? Aqui também tem todos os campos que, que fazem parte desse processo, né? Desde o momento de autorização. E também a gente tem os metadados aqui, com o dicionário de dados que explica o que é cada um desses campos, né? Isso aqui é interessante porque a gente tem ali o que, que o campo significa, o formato do campo, né? o qual que é o ID. Né? Então, a gente aqui, é, no processo mais de abertura de dados mesmo, de transparência, né? qualquer usuário tem condição de entender claramente o que, que tem no banco de dados e o processo como um todo. E caso venha a trabalhar ou reutilizar esse código, ele está todo explicado aqui, um dicionário de dados com cada campo que faz parte do projeto. Tá? É... Como a gente trabalhou também com uma lógica, a gente chama de workers, tá? porque nós usamos a linguagem JavaScript, por, usando também um framework que chama Node.js, que permite que a gente trabalhe JavaScript no back-end, né? que o, que o Node.js, é, o JavaScript é uma linguagem de front-end. Né? Então, para que a gente pudesse implementar isso, a gente trabalhou com esse framework do Node, e os workers são, são alguns scripts de JavaScript que eles ficam Dentro do motor de workflow, à medida que uma tarefa é chamada, é, o Node vai lá e, e dispara esse, esse script para que a gente possa automatizar o processo. Tá? Então, a gente tem scripts aqui de envio de e-mail para cada um dos fornecedores, de aprovação de material. É, esse ABI aqui é um arquivo JSON com os campos que a gente implementa no Ethereum. Né? Todos os campos do, do contrato tem que estar nesse ABI para que a rede blockchain possa receber essas informações e registrar. E também aqui alguns scripts que fazem a parte de pagamento, registro e assim sucessivamente, tá? Então, isso tudo está aberto, tá? O código está disponível para cada um de vocês quiser acompanhar e, e conhecer, né? Ah, e temos aqui também toda a parte de licença, a gente colocou as licenças abertas, tá? Então, esse código aqui está disponível, pessoal, caso tá? queiram reutilizar, é, refazer esse código, enfim, ele está livre para uso de todos, tá? A gente pensa que isso é uma construção de um bem público, né? Um produto que é público e a gente tem sempre essa lógica de disponibilizar e colaborar, né? É, quando a gente finalizou esse protótipo, só para encerrar a apresentação, é, nós fizemos uma uma série de issues aqui, tá? No próprio GitHub, que são desafios que a gente encontrou no, no processo de desenvolvimento do protótipo, e a gente escreveu essas issues aqui, para caso a comunidade de desenvolvedores é, verifique esse código 
tem interesse em colaborar, ela pode olhar aqui o que são os problemas que a gente ainda não conseguiu trabalhar com eles, tá? Então, é, aqui tem essa ideia da criação de uma aplicação front-end, né? nós, nós adotamos o motor de workflow do Camunda, mas em termos de usabilidade, né? Daquela ideia do user experience, ainda dá para melhorar muito, né? Então, a gente colocou uma eixo aqui para caso alguém que tenha é, interesse ou áreas que possam vir a trabalhar com isso, estão com isso aqui, é, tem toda a parte de integração com outros sistemas estruturantes do Estado, né, porque isso aqui é a construção de APIs para a gente conectar o projeto junto com o sistema fiscal, o sistema de protocolo eletrônico do Estado, uma série de outros sistemas também. É, esse serviço de mensageria direcionado, a gente fez um serviço de e-mail, mas que ele ainda não é inteligente o suficiente para que ele dispare automaticamente cada um dos serviços. Né? Então, nessa versão que a gente usa, o usuário precisa dizer qual é o e-mail do fornecedor ali que, que o motor disponibiliza para ele. Então, tem uma parte ainda que está feita manualmente. Né? E essa parte da implementação e participação em rede blockchain, que eu acho que é uma, um ponto bem importante. Né? É, nós fizemos todo esse desenvolvimento adotando a rede Ethereum, né? E o Ethereum, ele, como vocês sabem, né, ele é uma blockchain pública e ele precisa que você faça o pagamento das transações que são registradas em blockchain. Né? Ele usa a moeda local dele, é o Ether, né? mas é, existe uma, uma medida de processamento ali que a gente paga numa, numa, em gas, né? que é uma, uma, como é que eu vou dizer, é uma fração do Ether que a gente utiliza para pagar. Né? Então, é, o Estado ele não pode atualmente, legalmente, é, negociar criptomoedas, né? Então, a gente rodou o teste na rede Ethereum, mas para fins de colocar em produção, a gente precisaria ou desenvolver uma rede blockchain de governo, propriamente dita, tá? Hoje a gente vê, por exemplo, a rede blockchain Brasil aí que está tá nascendo, né? E também a gente poderia desenvolver uma rede estadual usando o Hyperledger Fabric ou alguma outra dessas tecnologias, ou também a gente tem discutido muito a ideia de participar de uma rede chamada LACChain, que é o Latin America Chain, que é um projeto feito pelo BID, e é uma rede que é consorciada, porém ela é, ela é gratuita para processamento, tá? Até inclusive universidades, entes públicos em, em geral, podem fazer parte dessa rede, basta que entrem em contato com a equipe da Lactchain, lá tem um processo de cadastramento e, e a partir daí a, pessoa, a instituição pode implementar o nó dessa rede, e a nossa intenção no caso aqui é trabalhar nesse sentido, né? Da gente participar de uma, dessa rede blockchain para que a gente possa colocar em produção esses protótipos, né? É, e algumas coisas também em relação a cálculo de saldos e monitoramento da qualidade de fornecedores, que são os desafios que a gente ainda está trabalhando, né, gente? É, de forma geral, acho que seria isso, pessoal. Eu não sei se eu consegui explicar ou passar toda, todo o projeto para vocês, né? Eu vou mandar para vocês o link tanto da página para vocês conhecerem o projeto quanto dos repositórios. Vou colocar ele para vocês aqui na, na, no chat. E... Espero que tenha sido do, do agrado de vocês. Eu fico aqui aberto para questionamentos. Maurício, muito obrigado. Fabrício, muito obrigado pela clara apresentação. Temos perguntas, então, no Sim, Eu tenho uma, uma, uma pergunta, na verdade, duas perguntas. É, uma é, esse projeto ainda está em, em fase de protótipo, certo? Ainda não, não, não está implementado, correto? Se eu entendi, Exato. Se eu entendi bem. Sim. É, é, a primeira pergunta seria que, que tipo de... de no, no, no curto, médio prazo, que tipo de indicadores né, vocês estão esperando em termos de desempenho, uma vez implementado isso? Vocês vão olhar né, para quais indicadores, um, dois, vocês vão olhar é, uma Sim, vez que isso esteja implementado? É... A gente... Oi. Opa, desculpa. Claro, é, não, se eu te fazer a segunda pergunta, e de repente você já, você já emenda. É, é... A segunda pergunta é, a gente está acostumado a ver é uma problemática que existe, pelo menos no, no, no nível local, é quando a gente fala de, de, de quando a gente tenta acessar a, a eficiência né, na questão das compras é a multiplicidade de cadastros né, ou duplicidade de cadastros que existem dentro das dentro do, 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 dos, das organizações públicas né é, como é que vocês como é que vocês, que, que vocês pensam disso como vocês lidaram com isso é, é, uma, é, um, é, uma, é uma fase que precisa ser é, é resolvida antes de implementar esse projeto é, com, com, como é que é isso, né? Como é que esse gargalo foi, foi resolvido? Serão essas duas perguntas e parabéns, viu? Obrigado. Bem, é, com relação à primeira pergunta, a gente trabalha ali, com, a, gente, a nossa intenção é trabalhar com métricas de monitoramento de processos, né? Então, a gente trabalha no, no tempo da, na questão da eficiência, né? Que é diminuir o tempo 
em que, que esse processo ocorre, né? na medida que alguém solicita o um material até a entrega, a gente tem um prazo legal de 14 dias, tá? mas a intenção é que a gente faça com que isso seja feito em tempo mais, mais curto. Né? Então, à medida que a gente vai processando cada uma das, das solicitações, a gente consegue verificar o tempo que foi, que foi gasto desde o momento da solicitação até o momento do pagamento, né? isso aí é uma das métricas que a gente adota, a outra métrica é o volume de, de solicitações que vai ocorrendo ali, porque a gente tem um volume gigantesco de, de pedidos né, de material de lista básica, tá? e a gente acredita que isso, muitas vezes, é, a, a gente, alguns órgãos têm dificuldade até em pedir, tá? muitas vezes o pessoal é, não... A gente trabalha com, com todo tipo de de setor, né? Então, tem alguns setores que estão mais acostumados a fazer o processamento disso tudo, né? Do, eu digo do processo burocrático legal mesmo, né? E, muitas vezes, eles até chegam a pedir para a gente para fazer esses pedidos, porque eles não sabem como fazer, tá? então, tem uma questão burocrática ali, mas a nossa intenção é que a gente consiga aumentar o volume de solicitações feitas na ponta, né? E agilizar esse processo e também acompanhar o volume financeiro que está sendo processado em cima disso, tá? Então, seria uma métrica de tempo uma métrica de volume de, 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 de instâncias, né, por assim dizer, né, de solicitações, e métrica de volume financeiro, tá? são as três que a gente está trabalhando hoje em dia. É, com relação a essa segunda pergunta, ela é bem pertinente, ela é muito interessante, porque a gente fez aqui mais ou menos, sabe aquela história de você construir a, o projeto enquanto as coisas vão acontecendo, né? a gente não pode parar o Estado enquanto a gente vai prototipando, né? e até eu não, eu não cheguei a detalhar isso no slide ali no início, mas a gente tem hoje no processo de compras, pelo, é, se, eu, se eu me recordo que rapidamente, são uns, pelo menos quatro sistemas, tá? A gente tem um sistema que é o sistema que faz o cadastro de fornecedores, né? E que é o, tanto do lado de cadastrar os fornecedores, né? Que, que é um, um problema para nós, porque muitas vezes esse cadastro, ele é antigo e tem muito fornecedor que não está mais vendendo para o Estado, que ainda está ali no cadastro, então a gente tem muita sujeira nessa base de dados de cadastro de fornecedores, tá? É, da mesma forma, na base de cadastro de itens, né, de materiais em si, é, para vocês terem uma ideia, tinha mais de 500 mil itens lá dentro, né? a, gente teve, a gente foi ao longo do trabalho também fazendo uma limpeza disso, tá? a gente chegando aí hoje em cento e poucos mil itens, tá? a gente tinha coisa ali desde charuto, é, garrafa de uísque, coisas assim, que vocês não podem imaginar o que tinha nesse cadastro. Né? Então, a gente também tem que fazer uma limpeza desse cadastro, tá? É, esse é um processo que ainda está em andamento, ele é bem moroso e ele não envolve só esse projeto em si, né? Ele envolve um, um trabalho maior dentro da diretoria de licitações, tá? É, e o que que acontece? Uma vez que a gente trabalha com sistemas diferentes, tá? É, a gente não consegue fazer uma linha mestra que vá desde o início até o final do processo, alinhando as informações, tá? Então, é, até a ideia de trabalhar esse motor de workflow como uma ideia de orquestrar o processo em si e a ideia de usar APIs, né? Porque, ao invés da gente... Como a gente, o sistema não é único, a gente precisa buscar uma informação. Por exemplo, quando o processo inicia, a gente abre o processo licitatório, então, as informações do edital da licitação, de, dos adjudicados, dessa, dessa etapa da fase de licitação, estão dentro de um sistema, tá? À medida que isso acontece, é, isso também, é, a, em paralelo, cada uma dessas etapas do processo de licitação, ele tem que ser registrado num segundo sistema, que é um sistema de gestão de protocolo, que aí ali tem os documentos que são gerados ao longo do processo de licitações, tá? Então, só para você ser melhor, antes da gente iniciar, o processo de execução do contrato em si, a gente já está lidando com pelo menos dois sistemas, né? que tem ainda o terceiro, que é o sistema de gestão fiscal do Estado, onde a gente faz o registro desses contratos tá? para fins de processamento de pagamento. Né? O sistema de gestão fiscal ele faz a gestão contábil e financeira do processo de compra, mas ele não faz a gestão administrativa. Tá? Então, aí a gente já está falando de três sistemas diferentes, que a gente tem dados espalhados nesses três sistemas, Muitas vezes a gente não tem ali campos para conectar essas tabelas todas, né? a ideia de fazer joins ali, porque, só para vocês terem uma ideia, por exemplo, né? no sistema de licitações, a gente trabalha com o, a chave primária, o número do contrato em si, tá? que é o contrato que sai lá, no, o número do edital do contrato. Quando o contrato é registrado no sistema de gestão fiscal, ele gera um outro uma outra identificador, uma outra chave, que é um número de contrato, só que não é o mesmo número do contrato edital, é, no sistema de gestão fiscal, 
cada, cada etapa, né, por exemplo, um contrato em si, ele é registrado e tem um número de contrato. Uma solicitação de fornecimento, ela é registrada e gera o um número de contrato da solicitação de fornecimento. Quando é feito o envio de um pagamento, aí tem a liquidação no sistema, gera um outro número. Então, a gente vai... A gente tem um problema muito grande em, em fazer com que todos esses dados sejam concatenados, né? E a gente tem a informação geral, tá? Inclusive, é um dos desafios que a gente tem daqui para frente. É, mas isso aí foi tudo feito no decorrer do, do, do processamento das compras, né? A gente acessava essas bases de dados, tá? E, é, criamos um, um data warehouse ali, usamos também uma, um data lake que o Estado já tem, e a gente foi buscando esses dados, essas informações dos diferentes sistemas, e quando a gente colocou isso dentro do, do projeto, aí foi aquelas duas tabelas que eu mostrei para vocês ali no código, que ali a gente tem todos os campos que a gente precisa no decorrer do processo, e eles vão sendo organizados numa única tabela. Então, a gente vai buscando de base de dados diferentes. Né? Então, é um processo que ainda é bastante experimental, né? até inclusive essa ideia de utilizar blockchain no Estado, é, se eu não me engano, no Estado de Santa Catarina, certamente é a primeira iniciativa, tá? É, e algumas que eu já vi em outros estados também, mas é embrionárias, né? nada que a gente vê em produção efetivamente. Mas até no decorrer desse trabalho todo, a gente percebeu que a gente vai precisar avançar para ou trabalhar uma lógica de integração muito bem feita, né? por meio de um orquestrador de processos ali, usando APIs para buscar e gravar informações em diferentes sistemas, e esse processamento ser feito pelo motor de workflow e, ao mesmo tempo, o registro das etapas críticas em blockchain, ou até mesmo partir para construir um novo sistema de gestão de contratos, tá? que faça esse processamento do início ao fim. Isso ainda é um grande problema para nós. Tá? A, gente, a gente trabalha usando o que a gente chama de sistemas estruturantes, né? que um cara que trabalha ali no dia a dia, no, no, na execução do contrato, ele trabalha com quatro, cinco pra, pra, quatro, cinco sistemas, e a gente acredita que boa parte disso a gente consegue automatizar, tá? Então, é um dos desafios, né? Então, o, o grande problema que eu vejo, realmente, é a questão das bases de dados, sabe? É, a gente tem muitas bases de dados ruins ainda, tá? O, a qualidade do dado para uso, ela ainda é, precisa ser bastante aprimorado, né? E, mas a intenção até mesmo da gente fazer esse projeto, junto com a Huntless também, era de pensar esse processo não a partir dos sistemas, né, mas a partir do próprio processo de compra. E essa ideia de trazer a blockchain, registrar cada uma dessas etapas, fez até que internamente né, a gente discutisse com as várias áreas e colocasse essas áreas em, em contato umas com as outras, para que cada uma das partes que estão envolvidas assim, nessa, nesse trabalho entendam o que, que a outra parte faz e comece a pensar que a informação que ela vai gerando aqui Muitas vezes a gente tem campos nos sistemas que são campos abertos, tá? A pessoa digita lá alguma coisa, e aí gente, às vezes a pessoa digita errado, né? Então a gente está ainda trabalhando muito a, a ideia de conscientizar né, as pessoas que estão envolvidas no sentido de que é importante que elas registrem corretamente cada uma das informações, porque isso tem impacto na etapa seguinte do processo, e esses dados vão sendo organizados ali no, no nosso protótipo para fins de uso, né? Mas é, é um desafio que a gente tem ainda, tá? Não sei se atendi a tu, a tu questionamento, mas é mais ou menos o que tem, a gente tem visto hoje em dia no Estado. Sim, sim, respondeu. Muito, muito obrigado. Tem uma pergunta aqui, só um minuto. É, tudo bom, Maurício? Bom dia. Bem, novamente, é, parabenizar pelo projeto. Né? Já tive a oportunidade de conhecer em outro momento, é, que é o Rennes, que trabalha no CERPRO. É, a minha dúvida é a seguinte. É, você falou né, que essa parte de licitação do processo de licitação não está incluso, né? mas existe a pretensão até no, no aspecto do que a parte de licitação, a parte de elaboração de proposta, é, a, parte de, a parte de ter a garantia do que foi é, colocado no edital de licitação, as propostas apresentadas, é, seria bem interessante ter isso dentro de blockchain para ter a garantia que é, o que de fato foi apresentado como proposta é, foi o que de fato foi contratado e foi o que de fato foi entregue. E existe essa pretensão do projeto de abarcar é, essa parte de licitação também, que poderia desembocar numa parte também de é, análise de fornecedores, porque, como você falou, né, assim, é, dados de qualidade é, é um grande diferencial. E se eu tenho dados que são oriundos de uma blockchain, é, são dados altamente confiáveis. 
Então, seria bem interessante, num futuro, a gente conseguir fazer analítica com esses dados que, são, que serão é, é, de alta qualidade, né? É, sim, é, boa pergunta, tá? É, é, o que, que a gente fez no início do trabalho? É, a gente precisava fechar um escopo, tá? É, e a gente, analisando todo o processo de contratação em si, é, concordo contigo, tá? Eu sou totalmente a favor dessa ideia, a gente tem falado sobre isso, é, é, mas o que, que acontece? O processo licitatório, tá? é, tanto a parte do planejamento quanto da, do pregão em si, da adjudicação, ele hoje não está em blockchain, é claro, mas ele é feito dentro de um sistema tá? que a gente chama de WebLeak, tá? que é um sistema de licitações. Então, ele é, está ele sendo já suportado por uma aplicação. Né? E, da mesma forma, a gestão financeira também está sendo é, suportada por uma aplicação. O que, que não existe hoje é a execução da administrativa dos contratos, tá? É, a gente optou por começar por, esse, por essa fase, né, de, após a, a licitação, uma vez que já está definido quem são os fornecedores, porque o processo licitatório, ele precisa, sim, claro, né, ser sempre bem monitorado, mas a gente acredita que, hoje em dia, ele já tem um nível de controle grande, né? Claro que ainda podem ocorrer desvios e tal, mas... O que a gente vê é que a maior parte dos problemas não ocorre na licitação, ocorre na execução do contrato, tá? Então, é, para vocês terem uma ideia, hoje em dia, isso aí que a gente estava mostrando para vocês, né, desse, dessa solicitação de produtos e envio e monitoramento de tudo isso, ele era feito em planilha de Excel e e-mail sendo mandado, tá? E isso aí é feito na mão mesmo, a pessoa envia o e-mail para o fornecedor, liga para o fornecedor e, manda, e recebe o e-mail de volta, e fica aguardando o produto chegar e não tem ideia de quando que o fornecedor mandou, né? Então, é, é a parte que a gente viu como a mais fragilizada do processo inteiro, tá? Então, é, a gente, inclusive, com a equipe da Hutchins, a gente tinha um tempo ali do acordo de cooperação, né? E a gente discutiu bastante sobre isso e concluímos o seguinte, se a gente quisesse trabalhar o processo desde o início, desde o planejamento da compra até o final, a gente poderia até avançar também e falar da, do consumo desse material, né? uma vez que ele é entregue no órgão, ter isso inventariado e a gente fazer o consumo do estoque também, né? que já seria uma parte posterior à parte que a gente trabalhou aqui, né? e que também é, seria algo que a gente queria encadear tudo em blockchain. O problema foi que a gente falou, cara, se a gente quiser abraçar o mundo, a gente não vai entregar nada, né? Sabe aquela ideia do, perfe... do feito? É melhor que o perfeito, no sentido que a gente conseguiria ter um escopo de projeto que fosse factível de ser executado no tempo que a gente tinha, tá? E, e também, trabalhando com a... uma das questões que foram para nós importantes, era o fato de que não existe um... uma aplicação suportando essa etapa, né? principalmente da parte de contratação de materiais básicos, né? não só de materiais básicos, né? alguns outros materiais também, de compras em geral, é, isso não é feito, né? a gente tem um controle unicamente contábil e financeiro, tá? mas o, o, a parte física mesmo, administrativa, não existe sistema que faça isso hoje no Estado, então a gente optou por trabalhar ali porque era a, a parte mais, é, que tinha o maior risco de problema, né? porque justamente, imagina, a gente está trabalhando ali com 37 órgãos de governo, tá? a gente tem diversos compradores, aí cada comprador tem lá uma planilha de Excel que ele vai lançando as informações deles, alguns órgãos sequer tem isso, tá? Só tem, manda o um e-mail para o fornecedor e nem acompanha, né? Porque os órgãos mais organizados, muitas vezes, eles trabalham é, de, em paralelo, né? Monta uma tabela, daí ele coloca a data ali no, no Excel de quando ele fez o pedido e vai fazendo esse controle. É, só que isso aí, para nós, hoje é a fase crítica e por isso nós optamos por iniciar por ali, tá? É, mas, obviamente, que, que a, o, isso, sim, pode ser estendível né, para todas as outras etapas do processo. E a gente, agora, nesse caso, a gente está numa mudança de governo aqui no Estado. Né? Inclusive, o governo que está assumindo não, era o que estava na oposição. Então, é, até a gente já começou, nesse final, agora já discutir também é, uma plataforma né, para a gente embarcar tudo isso, como a gente pensar uma lógica, tipo uma uma AWS, um Azure, algo similar a isso, que a gente pudesse colocar todas essas aplicações rodando ali e conectando isso em blockchain e tendo banco de dados ali, enfim. Mas isso ainda está em fase de desenvolvimento, tá? É, inclusive, vocês no certo aí, né? Eu acho que vocês também têm trabalhado essa lógica da rede blockchain Brasil, né? E não sei se são exatamente vocês aí, mas é uma outra questão também que a gente está discutindo no Estado, né? Porque 
É, a gente tinha até uma intenção aqui, trabalhando com o nosso centro de automação e informática, né, que é o CIASC, de montar uma blockchain. Só que assim, a força da blockchain está na quantidade de nós, né? Então, a gente tem uma blockchain com dois nós, que seria um nó conosco ali dentro da Secretaria da Administração e um outro nó dentro do centro de automação, a gente acredita que não seria o nível de segurança necessário. Né? Então, é, enfim, tem uma série de desafios para serem cumpridos ainda nesse trabalho e a intenção nossa foi muito de prototipar e mostrar para a gestão, né, que é a atual gestão, que é possível né, a gente trabalhar com blockchain no setor público e trazer algumas questões que são críticas na gestão pública para dentro para essa lógica né a gente usar tecnologias aí que são emergentes para apoiar né aprimorar o processo de gestão da, das compras públicas apoiar também a transparência enfim né mas foi por questão de escopo mesmo tá a gente optou por esse caminho mas com certeza é, eu acredito que a sugestão que você está falando aí está dentro das nossas ideias e ela é importantíssima Uh, por favor, tem mais alguma pergunta da audiência? Não? Então, é, Maurício Liro, Fabrícia, muito, muito obrigado. Ah, Fabrícia, conseguiu ah, digitar a câmera? Nem que seja no último segundo, mas funcionou, isso que importa. Então, muito bom, obrigado por, é, pela apresentação, pelo, pelo interessante pesquisa que vocês desenvolveram e a intervenção, né? Mais do que a pesquisa, a real intervenção lá na, na Secretaria de da Santa Catarina. Então, por favor, me ajuda aqui a agradecer a participação do Maurício e da Fabrícia. É, e com isso, pessoal, chegamos ao final. So, considering that we have Hilal and Henrico here with us, so I'll move back to English. Thank you indeed for all of you attending to this conference, presenting, discussing, participating. And I'm very happy that this is the seventh year in a whole that we have this partnership with Huttigers. And I do intend to keep it for at least seven years more. So save that date, I don't know when, but for sure next year we'll be back here in person in the building. I hope everyone including bring more colleagues from abroad. As this time I, had, I was lucky that Hilal could come. So please, Hilal, join me in this closing session speaking in behalf of Hudekar, please. Thank you very much, Ricardo. I would like to thank everyone uh, on behalf of Rutgers University, especially to Ricardo and uh, FGV for organizing this wonderful uh, conference. It was a great pleasure to be here. I listen to all the interesting presentations, be part of the discussion. Uh, Miklos also apologized that he couldn't be here today. He had a prior appointment uh, for today. Uh, but I hope to keep in touch with everyone and uh, hope to see you all soon. So thank you, Hilal. Thank you indeed. And just to finish, I need to highlight once more uh, how important was the sponsorship from CAPES, PAEP, that make it available to pay for the flying tickets that we paid, the, all other costs, including the, the lunch and this, everything that we could offer you due to CAPS financial support. So once again, muito obrigado também, repetindo aqui o tão importante apoio da CAPS. Muito obrigado ao apoio da CAPS PAEP, da Fundação Estúdio Vargas e da Huntigas por mais essa rodada, mais esse evento realizado aqui na nossa parceria. E, claro, a audiência né? se, e os apresentadores. Se não fosse por vocês, não haveria o colóquio. Então, é, a gente teve aqui a felicidade de contar com representantes de... How many? I don't remember anymore. Probably... 10 different programs, 10 different universities, as well as uh, representatives from, I would say, more than 10 uh, organizations as well, from public sector and private sector. Uh, I will not name all of them, but thank you once again for everything. So that's it. This is closed session. Now it's time for preparing ourselves for the Brazilian match later today. Well, let's hope everything goes all right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Muito obrigado a todos. Um grande abraço. Boa Copa do Mundo a todos.